I'll now call the November 10th, 2020 regular meeting of the Board of Supervisors to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Good morning. Good morning. If I could remind people on Teams to please mute yourself. Otherwise we get feedback in the chambers. Thank you. Supervisor, I'll do roll call now. Supervisor Leopold. Here. Friend. Here. Coonerty. Here. McPherson. Here. And Chair Caput. Here. Uh, <clears throat> we get, we'll have a moment of silence and uh, prayer followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Supervisor McPherson, just quickly, I just wanted to make a, a point out a special recognition to an outstanding citizen who recently passed away, Hal Hyde. He meant so much to this community, uh, especially in the uh, Cabrillo College, uh, the University of California, Santa Cruz. He was a dynamic leader and just a pleasant person to get along with. And we missed a true, true patriot and a great citizen and uh, really uh, someone who contributed to our uh, community time and time again. Hal Hyde was a phenomenal person and we're gonna miss him dearly in this county. He did so much for Santa Cruz County. I just wanted to recognize him. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, absolutely. Uh, in World War II, he was uh, at the Battle of the Bulge and uh, uh, late, in later years, uh, he uh, uh, achieved the rank of Brigadier General. Uh, and uh, Watsonville residents, uh, Pajaro Valley resident his whole life. Absolutely. Uh, what we'll do is, uh, do we, do we uh, have any uh, revisions or late, uh, late items? Chair Caput, yes, we do have a number of revisions and corrections to the agenda. On the consent agenda number 26, there are additional materials. We have an attachment C ADM 29 form packet page 648. On item number 42, there are additional materials. There's a revised attachment A packet page 919. There are clean and strikeout underlying copies. There's also an attachment C insert after page 920. On item number 43, staff requests this item be deleted. It's packet pages 926 through 932. And then on item 52, we have a correction. The item should read, accept and file update on emergency action with Lewis Tree Service for emergency road debris removal impacting critical roadway facilities and direct public works to return on or before Dece December 8th, 2020 with a contract and report on the status of the emergency work as recommended by the Deputy CAO Director of Public Works. And that's the end of the corrections. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, do we have any uh, uh, board member members that would uh, wish to pull items from the consent agenda or make any uh, comments? We'll usually do the comments after the, the, uh, the oral communication. Okay. Uh, what I'll do is I'm gonna pull, uh, uh, we'll do them together, uh, item 21 and 23, uh, 21, 23, uh, and uh, they're related. Number 22 is not, I don't know why, but uh, anyway, uh, and we'll, we'll speak on those. Uh, I'm, I'm only pulling it because I was requested to do it for transparency. It seems like uh, 21 and 23 are well written, but for transparency purposes. Okay. 
uh, and hopefully we can do that before 945 because we do have a scheduled item that we have to begin at 945. Um, and have to put it on the regular agenda. Okay. Chair. Yeah, you have to put them on the regular agenda. Yeah. Would you like to put them as 7.1 and 7.2 then? Would you like them at the beginning? Okay, yeah. Let's make it 7.1 and 7.2. What, what number will that be? That would be the first item on the uh, agenda. Yes. Well, actually it would be after 7.0. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, I, the only comment I'll make is uh, tomorrow is Veterans Day, uh, November 11th at the 11 o'clock. Uh, is the uh, online ceremony uh, done, being done virtual this year instead of having a parade in Watsonville. It'll be done uh, virtually at 11 a.m. tomorrow uh, and uh, it'll be online. And the other thing I'd like to say is I wanna thank uh, Supervisor Leopold for helping me out up here. <laughs> uh, my, my hearing is okay. But with everybody wearing masks and uh, everything coming out, it's uh, difficult for me to hear uh, everything as clear as I would like to be able to hear everything. Uh, I have a slight hearing loss and uh, with the masks and everything else, it makes it real difficult, but he's been helping me out up here and uh, making me uh, look good at times, so. Anyway, thanks a lot. Thank you. We, okay. we, all, we have to look out after each other. I know. And, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, public comment. Uh, uh, go ahead, uh, we'll have public comment for members to address the board on topics on today's agenda, consent items, closed session agenda, and topics that are not on the agenda, but within the jurisdiction of our board. If you cannot stay later to speak on a regular agenda item, you may address those items at this time. Today's agenda includes a scheduled item at 9.45 a.m. In order to begin items number on time, public comment is limited to only 30 minutes and any remaining public uh, still wanting to make a comment may do so at the end of the agenda, which would might even be in the afternoon. So if is two minutes okay, go ahead. Okay, we'll, we'll be uh, watching. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Veronica Velasquez. I'm a senior social worker and the chapter president for SEIU 521 Santa Cruz County. I'm here to address item number 27 on the board's consent agenda. When COVID-19 first hit our community, while everyone was sheltering in place, our members continued to show up to work. Despite the fear and uncertainty we all faced in March, our members showed up every day, fixing roads, protecting children, caring for the homeless, and doing all the other work that it takes for our county to continue running. We knew that COVID-19 would hit our local economy hard. When management asked us to furlough, we agreed to do so. When management asked us to consider extending the contract, we agreed to do so. When management told us that a cost of living increase would not be possible, we agreed and did not push back, despite the tremendous sacrifices meant for our members. Now we are asking you as the Board of Supervisors to honor the sacrifices our members have made by maintaining the county's 95-90-90 contribution to our health insurance premiums. This pandemic has shown us the importance of health care. As the stories we will share with you today show, management's proposal means members having to separate from doctors they've had for generations and foregoing needed physical treatment. This is too much and I wanna make it very clear that our membership will do whatever it takes to protect our members and our families. We are calling on you to do the right thing and maintain the county's 95, 90, 90 contribution to our health insurance premiums. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Claudia Herrera Sandoval. I have been a social worker for Santa Cruz County for 15 years. 
Part of our work as social workers requires that every six months we report to the court the status of the medical, dental, and emotional needs of the children that we work with. We require that every child in care gets a full physical in the first 30 days they enter care. This demonstrates how serious we take the health and well-being of children. I'm here to re respectfully request that you take the health and, of county workers and our families just as serious, and that we don't take another hit to our already reduced paycheck. We already gave back. 7.5% of our salary. It may not sound like a lot to you, but my, my paycheck has a deduction of over $300 per pay period. Increasing insurance cost for the plan that I carry for me, my husband and our three boys, will mean that I take an extra $200 hit off of my paycheck on top of the furlough deduction. I cannot afford any more deductions to my pay. Please meet with your managers and figure out a way to make our health care a priority so that we continue to care for the children and families in the community. Thank you for your time. Good morning. My name is Jennifer Getchman. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, senior mental health client specialist for HSA Behavioral Health, and a member of our union's bargaining team, as well as a union steward. I'm here to address item number 27 on the board's consent agenda. COVID-19 has had a huge impact on our community and us as union members. For the sake of our community's well-being and the time, at the time of this pandemic, we have made many sacrifices from furloughing to foregoing COLA negotiations. We can't forego is what we can't forego is the county's contribution to our health care. We're just asking them to meet us a little bit more in the middle. We're asking the board to honor your past commitment to our members by matching the 95 90 90 of employees premiums. Management's proposal to not cover the 2021 increase in health care cost will cost our members hundreds of dollars every month at a time when we are most vulnerable. This is not an, abstra an abstraction. These are the real people whose lives are at stake. I'm going to share with you some stories from our members. These are just a few of the stories of how employees will be impacted by management's decisions. These go from giving up lifetime therapists for our children to foregoing college tuition to changing providers and, and overall health care from PPOs to HMOs. Um, please read their stories and do the right thing. Match 95, 90, 90 of employees premiums for 2021. Good morning, Chair Caput, members of the board. Jim Heaney, I'm the chief steward for our county chapter here, SEIU. You know, four years ago, we uh, approved a new contract which took us, took us through September, 2020. And four years ago, 2020 sounded like a really good date, you know, and uh, we've all been very surprised what's happened this year. But part of what we've done as employees in this county is dive in to help contribute. You know, all of our members uh, are working hard in this process and many of them are on the front lines. Um, they knock on doors daily to do home checks. People don't expect them to be there because that's the point, it's a surprise visit to make sure the children are safe. So they're putting themselves in harm's way. And for many years as a county employee, I've heard at various times statements about how much the county staff is valued. But what, what I really have to say to you today is we're asking you to show that. We have a real concern with the way that the healthcare is being costed against us. Currently, we're told that it's a $1.5 million increase to the budget. However, during the conversations around negotiation, we found out that over $900,000 has already been budgeted towards that health care increase. So we want you to look hard at these numbers. We have other concerns with costing. Uh, we are trying to have an individual meetings with you to explain that. But really what we're asking today is for you to turn around and authorize your management team to fulfill our negotiation proposal, which is, you know, based on the 2021 rates, not an average of the 2020 and the 2021 to cost individuals hundreds of dollars. Finally, Chair Caput, thank you for the acknowledgement of veterans today. My father and many of my siblings are retired military veterans. My father was 20 years in the Navy Chief Petty Officer 
And he got to live out his life with dignity because he had quality medical coverage through his service. And so we ask you to do the same. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Kevin Collins. Uh, I live about five miles from the CCU fire perimeter. The moment that fire was out, I uh, drove into the fire zone as quickly as I could because I wanted to understand what, what, ha what had happened and uh, how much of the landscape had been damaged and to what extent. And in the process of doing that, I came across this astounding level of demolition of forest that with pg and &E was executing. They uh, have this notion that they can knock down any tree that might fall someday into their circuits, no matter how, out to 200 feet away from the circuit. So I brought in a, and Cal Fire has issued a notice of violation to pg and &E, asserting that they're conducting timber operations without a permit. pg and &E is ignoring Cal Fire's order to stop. So this is a picture from Vic Drive up off Empire Grade. These are all living Douglas firs and a giant pile dropped on the ground, left for I don't know who to clean up. Uh, this is a home site. Every tree on this home site is demolished in a pile. These people were driven out by the fire. They couldn't protect their properties and that's what's left of them. Here's another such shot. This is the largest madrone specimen I've ever seen. It's right in front of the burned out house where it stood. That tree was probably two or 300 years old. It's a pile of rubble now. This is a picture of a Davy tree truck after Cal Fire told them to cease operations. And uh, I don't have time to show every last image here, but uh, to give you a sense of the scale of this, this is a road strung with piles of destroyed trees. I really would hope that the county could take more action. pg and &E is the largest utility in the United States. They're totally arrogant and citizens cannot handle this on our own. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Kristen Sandell and I am a constituent from Ben Lomond. I'm here to comment on pg and actions in the wake of the CZU fires. So these fires were absolutely devastating for the community. Everyone who lives in the mountains was affected, but possibly even more devastating has been the trauma inflicted on the survivors by the excessive and grossly negligent tree removals conducted by pg and &E. What we're seeing is almost clear cutting operations by pg and &E contractors in mountain communities, particularly through Bonnie Dune. I and many others have driven through the burn zones. We've seen the wholesale and unnecessary destruction of surviving trees of all species, both those damaged by fire, but still living, which would survive and completely untouched trees now being destroyed for the convenience of pg and &E. We're losing redwoods, oaks, madrones, and many other species, which residents were told by Santa Cruz County's resource conservation district to leave intact to help retain soil. The soil in these areas has been pulverized by heavy equipment into fine dust, many inches deep, which will be liquefied during heavy rains, placing residents in imminent danger of possibly lethal mud and debris flows carrying tons of hazardous material downhill at high speed. As happened in Santa Barbara County in 2018, resulting in 23 deaths. We are asking as your constituents at the board do everything in its power to stop this incredibly dangerous and unnecessary behavior from PG&E and protect residents of the Santa Cruz mountains while we begin to rebuild our homes and communities from one of the worst wildfires in California history. Thank you. Oh, it's two minutes now, Chair Caput. Well, just uh, it should just be three minutes, of agenda, course. PG&E, poison, gas, and explosions. What it stands for, an immense destruction. Your job should be to stop this. 
destruction. The trees are the lungs of the earth. I want to talk about 5G. The pandemic began with 5G. And I want to refer you to Arthur Furstenberg's cellular phone task force.org and go to his newsletters. And there's a question I read somewhere related. Is the bioengineered coronavirus pandemic being purposefully propagated globally in order to further facilitate the military deployment of 5G worldwide in space and on Earth. Satellites are being launched in the thousands into the ionosphere, which provides us with the electrical circuit of the Earth upon which all life is dependent. This needs to stop. And I'm going to quote from 5G apocalypse, the extinction events, the opening words of the film. It's important to understand what the 5G is doing and what they say it is doing. We're told on the IEE beam forming document that's, uh, what is it, electrical engineers group, that this technology cooks your eyes like eggs in World War II. We all need to understand these are military weapons. These are assault frequencies. If you know nothing more than that, that's what you need to know. It's microwave radiation warfare. That's what it is. And that's what's threatening all life on earth. We, that's what we need to stop. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Hi. Well, thank you, Marilyn. Not many people up there probably realize how many people know the information Marilyn knows. And it may all sound like sci-fi, but I invite each and every one of you to actually look at, into these things. These are real things that Marilyn is talking about. Really frightening things. Humanity, well, we know humanity does awful things. Look what we've done to the environment. Look what we do to our environment even here. I picked up so much trash yesterday on the beach just as I was just walking to use the restroom. I couldn't believe it. it, it just So yes. It's no joke, and, and for Marilyn to take her the time out of her life to come in here time after time after time and tell you guys about this and have you not take any action or show any interest in it is really disappointing. But that wasn't what I came up here to talk about today. What well, kind of is connected? So I'm thinking about representative government. Does representative government mean that those with medical disabilities, medical things that keep them from wearing masks, things that are allowed for within the writing that is generated by your jurisdiction. Is it right that these people are discriminated against and not allowed to be present and have their voices heard? You say, oh, they can call in or, oh, they can send in and have their comments read on emails. So when they send their emails in, their emails are not read. Is that representative government? I don't understand that as being representative government. I had a friend call me last week and said that the emails were not being read. There was no mention of the emails being, that were, had come in as comments from the public. That's not representative government. So I would like each and every one of you to look into your, look inside yourselves and decide what sort of representative do you want to be? Do you want to be a representative of the people? And if not, what are you representing? Thank you. Hey, how are you doing? Oh, I'm great. <laughs> nice that we can all stand and talk to each other and see each other. My name is James Ewing Whitman. I would like three minutes, but we'll see what happens. So today, Washington, D.C. is passing Bill B-23-0171, allowing children 11 years and older to be vaccinated without their parental knowledge or consent. That's kind of, uh, that's ugly. It's the politest word I can think of. Where to begin, once again, thank you. If I had ever stated in any room that I might have said something that offended somebody, 
like quitting smoking, I've done that a thousand times, WDC, WC Fields. So I did write some stuff, but uh, you know, there's a lot of information coming, about the, uh, coming out about the CZSU fires. And there was a gentleman in this room who was describing on his own property a, a whole packets of steel stakes that appear, they didn't melt, but they just belt, they just, they just bent over, they, they didn't melt. So what does steel melt at, 3,200 degrees? So I do a lot of research, it's a lot of fun, it's kind of daunting. Probably read a thousand articles and seen a, several hundred videos on wireless frequencies. There's a very small percentage, less than 10% that are about the healing qualities of these frequencies. There's quite a bit about them being weapons. Um, Recently, someone that I respect said the first directed energy weapons that he was aware of was in 1991 with the Oakland fires. But this gentleman in Australia talked about what happened in 1983 in Australia. And one of the scientists that spoke, he said that when you can put the frequencies just below the frequency of these various minerals, I'm talking about glass, aluminum, and steel, you can get them to bend and melt at a much lower temperature. So anyway, thank you for your time. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Becky Steinbrunner. I'm a resident of rural Aptos. I'm holding my mask this way because I can't breathe when it's completely over my face. I have tried your alternative methods from home submitting emails and received response they, saying that the clerk would be available in 24 hours. So your alternative methods do not work for those of us who cannot breathe with these masks on. I've been assured that holding it like this so I can breathe and not pass out is okay. So I'm gonna continue. I want to uh, support the county um, workers that came before you this morning. I find it um, unacceptable that you can throw money at all kinds of things, including um, a 77,000 voting mobile trailer that has never been needed before. And, and we all got along quite well without. And it's nice, but in these times, that's a superfluous expenditure of money. And now you're asking the county workers to suffer. It doesn't make sense. I wanna to speak to consent agenda item 44, where you're increasing the, your contract with Encompass by nearly a quarter million dollars when you're already paying them millions of dollars for services. That's very nice, but again, in these times of of economic stress, that's superfluous. I want to tell you that um, I also support reinstating the full-time position of the County Emergency Services Manager. It's being handed over carte blanche to the director, the CAO. He knows nothing about the relationships that Rosemary Anderson has worked hard to, to cultivate. In my last remaining time, I want to say that in uh, November 2nd, uh, Sutter Superior County Superior Court ruled that Governor Newsom's executive order regarding the elections was illegal. It violated the state constitution. And we have to take him to task and we have to abide by the law. You have taken an oath to protect the constitution. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ludmila Boyka, and my question is when this county finally will do anything to regular people, but not just for their employees. Because it seems like it's very big and very strong, very consolidated team of county that try to cover up every misconduct that any employee committed. And it is a lot constantly, and no one get investigated. So I'm requesting the investigation, especially mental health department. I spent two months in front of district attorney door, and they refused to schedule an appointment with district attorney. I never saw district attorney. I even wonder if he's alive, if it's a real person. So why it's so difficult for someone who was victimized Family, entire family was victimized and cannot get an appointment with district attorney. And no, none of them, of course, you know, willing to 
um, start any investigation. I sent email, um, Mr. Caput, to you as a member of the mental health board. So I'm requesting you respond, please, because it's not just unfair practices, it's dangerous practices committed by the Behavioral Health Division that need to take care of and need to look into. Many workers even do not have California certification and they have to take care of people. The part of homelessness that we have here because of that department unfair practices. They just push people out on the streets and while they don't even take care of them. So please order the investigation of their practices. And I will wait to the answer by email. Thank you. Chair, Chair, we have one web comment. Yes, uh, I, I saw that, go ahead. Thank you. It is from Satya Orion. In a recent Sentinel, or new, Sorry, let me start over. In a recent Sentinel News article, Gail Newell is quoted as saying, there is a growing evidence to support that the person wearing the face covering also benefits with evidence showing that there is lower inoculum with masks so people are getting less sick even if infected, which is shown in the low hospitalization rate, unquote. On what science is this opinion based? No one was, none was given. Has Dr. Newell forgotten the most that most cases have always had mild or no symptoms and that hospitaliz hospitalization rates have always been low with hospitals mostly empty and overflow tents never used. This was confirmed by Dominican hospital nurses. Why has the county stopped sharing information on, I'm sorry, I lost my place, um, for COVID related deaths? The information was provided to me freely for the first 10 persons who died, but suddenly is no longer is suddenly no longer available. Why? That the county has decided to be less rather than more transparent is a shame and extremely disrespectful to the community. Why are cases the only metric being considered? Cases based on a PCR test, which has never intended for diagnostic, diagnostic purposes and which has proven to give high levels of false positives. The survival rate continues to be over 99%. Why is this information not being shared? On July 29th, I sent a scientific studies to you and Dr. Newell proving the effectiveness of hydroxychloroquine in treating COVID-19. Why have you not shared this information with the community? Why did you not share this information with the Watsonville Post-Acute Center, with hospitals and other care settings? Instead of being open to treatments that have been proven to work, creating a community forum for information sharing, you have instead promoted masks and social distancing both with no scientific proof or efficiency, both which have created a climate of hatred and virtue signaling. With zero support for those in the community who are medically exempt, this disregard to community under the guise of health is shameful and fraudulent. And that is the only web public okay. comment we have. Right. Uh, is there anybody in the community room? The community room is closed today. Okay. Uh, well, next we have item number six. We can do that. Well, we have to do the consent agenda. Usually we take, we take comments from board members about the consent agenda. Right. Okay. I don't have any, uh, I was gonna comment on items 21 and 23, but we pulled those. So you might that's, wanna check with our- That's in your district, right? Yes. Okay. You might wanna check with our colleagues. Okay. Uh, yeah, any other comments from board members? No, Mr. Chair, this is uh, Supervisor McPherson. There, can you hear me all right? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, there's a couple questions I have on, I don't want to pull anything, but on item number 19, the uh, Coronavirus the Emergency Solutions Grant Program, uh, I want to thank the CAO for bringing this forward. I'm glad we're eligible uh, for another $9 million going forward to provide services related to COVID-19. Uh, I appreciate the ongoing reporting to the board on the CARES Act funding and how it's being allocated. And I look forward to more detailed report before the money is all spent. I do have a question. Uh, when do we anticipate having an expenditure plan for this new money, this $9 million? And will it be uh, allocated using the same process as we have been in the past? I could get a quick answer from the CEO. 
Good morning, Elisa Benson, Assistant CAO, and I have responsibilities for our Homeless Services Coordination Office. We do have a spending plan for the uh, CARES Act ESGCV dollars that we were allocated from the state. This money is allocated actually to our Continuum of Care, the HAP program. And we are actually submitting, we submitted our application last week, which we have to do to um, actually receive the dollars. In that application, we, uh, we presumed about $5 million of that funding to support our COVID shelters moving into 2021 in January through June. As we all know, that has been both FEMA funded as well as, that, well as um, CRF uh, CARES Act funded. And that funding that we're using this year ends in December. The remaining dollars are really gonna be focused on priorities of that grant, which is around housing our homeless folks that are in our uh, COVID shelter and care system right now. With the bulk of the dollars being focused on 200 units of rapid rental rehousing program. So that's a program where you use case management, housing navigation, and some rental, titrated rental assistance to help people get housed and, and out of shelter. Um, there'll be a small piece that's about administration. It's gonna be a big program to run. Um, and the way I think we'll be doing it is predominantly through letters of interest to community providers. Happy to provide any more uh, information on that. And we're, we're very excited to get started. The next item that we'll be hearing at 945, um, this investment that we're able to do through this, uh, the CARES Act dollars aligns with our, our, our action plan to address homelessness in the community. Happy to have answer any more questions, Supervisor. Well, that, that's fine. Thank you very much. Uh, and I, I'm encouraged about uh, addressing the housing issue uh, in more depth. Um, I don't know that anybody else has any questions, but I do have a few other comments on a couple items on consent. Uh, number 20, the Association of Faith Communities, uh, the Safe Spaces. Uh, I want to thank all of the AFC members for their work on this program. We appreciate the faith communities for working together with us uh, to provide this service. Uh, we want to expand this program, and I know that we do have some folks uh, or some agencies or faith communities uh, in the 5th District uh, that are interested in uh, joining in on this. So I just want to say thank you to all who have participated, and we welcome anyone who might be interested in participating in this uh, program to provide uh, housing and some care for uh, in a small numbers uh, from the faith community. So uh, just thank you very much. Uh, on the Zone Haven on number 26, I can't overemphasize the importance uh, of having Zone Haven when it comes to managing our response to disasters, which we're, we're doing it now and related to debris float as well. Uh, these, uh, this Zone Haven where you let people know where they need to go uh, is very important uh, in evacuation planning. Uh, I want to thank Cal Fire Chief Ian Larkin for working with Zone Haven uh, to secure a grant funding that was made possible for use here in Santa Cruz County. Um, and in, kind of, um, in terms of funding for this program, it's obviously a worthwhile investment in our pedestrian uh, planning too, and our preparedness planning, I should say. Uh, the I, I have a question on number 27, the COVID-19 costs. Uh, I want to thank the General Services Department for bringing this item forward. It's really important for us to see what the county has spent to date on serving residents during the, uh, this crisis. Uh, I think we have spent up to $30 million right now. Uh, I know we can't be certain right now how much of this will be reimbursed, but do we have any estimate based on what percentages are allowed in each category at this time? Uh, thank you, Supervisor. Uh, Michael Beaton, Director of General Services uh, for the county. Uh, our current estimates right now of the $30.9 million as reported in the report is a little over 50% will be eligible FEMA reimbursable costs. Uh, we are currently estimating that between 12 and $15 million uh, will be reimbursed through FEMA, an additional 3 to $5 million through the state CDAA. Uh, the remaining balance is currently uh, being utilized through different granting agencies, uh, redirection of public health grants, CARES Act, uh, as well as other homeless funds uh, that are available within the current budgeted appropriations. Um, I know it's not the exact numbers that yeah. we would like to have, but um, those are the estimates that we currently have, sir. Thank you. That gives me a better idea. I think it gives us all a better idea, so thank you very much. Uh, I do, and the items uh, 45 to 54, 
on the fire re repair uh, progress. I, I can't say enough about our public works department for the repairs for to our infrastructure. Uh, this work has been happening at an amazingly fast rate, uh, and we all appreciate the restoration of our roads, wastewater systems, and other key sectors in our infrastructure. Uh, really, it's been quite amazing to me of how the Public Works Department has and others have been able to do this work under the crisis situations that we have now. Uh, and then not something that's not on the agenda, I think it's very important, though, that uh, Supervisor Coonerty and I uh, we were really concerned about the possibility of mud flows, debris flow, evacuation, and so forth. Uh, we're going to have town halls uh, this week, uh, Thursday, November 12th, from 5.30 to 7. Uh, that's a District 5 town hall. Um, and uh, people can call in to talk about that at 916-318-9542. And the District 3 town hall will be Friday from 11.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, for the third district. Uh, these are uh, important, and I think anybody who is interested, we really welcome them to join us in those town halls. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Any other comments from supervisors? Yes, Mr. Chair, this is Supervisor Friend. I just briefly want to comment on item 25, the Sea Cliff Village Park uh, restroom project and thank Public Works for their, excuse me, at Parks for their commitment on that project. Uh, I was out there again recently and, and it really adds so much to have that permanent restroom along with, with the skate park and other new facilities that are there. People are out enjoying it in a safe and distanced way. And I just appreciate Parks commitment to uh, locating the funding over the course of a couple of years with our office for that. So thanks to Parks on this. Okay. Supervisor Coonerty. No comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you. I would move the uh, the consent agenda as amended. Okay. We have a motion. Second. 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 Okay. That concludes uh, public comment on the consent agenda, except for item 21 and 23. We have to take the vote. Okay. Call for a vote. Thank you. Supervisor Leopold. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Chair Caput? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, should we, uh, we have to hold on? We have a 9.45 scheduled item. We're right at 9.45, so we could get going with that. Great. Yes, that's item number 10 on the agenda. Item number 10. You wanna read it in? Uh, Read it in, or you want me to read it in? Which one? Number 10. Number 10, yeah. Conduct a study session on draft three year strategic framework to address homelessness developed through the professional engagement with homelessness technical assistance provider, focus strategies, and direct staff to undertake a community engagement process and return no later than the first board meeting in February 2021 with a final draft for adoption as outlined in the memorandum from the county administrative officer. There's the housing for healthy Santa Cruz, a strategic framework, uh, Santa Cruz predictive modeling summary report, Santa Cruz County housing market gap analysis, the California continuum of care 2009 uh, point in time counts and the county and continuum of care funding sources scan January 2020 or June 2020. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Elisa Benson, assistant CAO. Um, I was, uh, Supervisor Leopold mentioned, our focus for our study today is kind of, it's kind of a big milestone. This is our final deliverable, our housing for a healthy Santa Cruz, a three-year strategic framework to address homelessness in Santa Cruz County. This is our, as I mentioned, our final deliverable from a nearly 18 month engagement with focus strategies to perform an assessment of our response to homelessness in collaboration with a broad set of partners and to design an action results focused improvement plan. I'm here today with Randy Morris, our human services department director, as the new division housing for health will play a key role in leading the, and coordination of this, the implementation of the framework. In addition to Randy, we have our consultants, Kate Bristol and Catherine Gale, 
waiting in the virtual wings to answer any technical questions that Randy and I aren't able to answer. And also we've invited uh, today city council members from our city partners to participate in the study session as the success of this work will rely on all jurisdictions commitment and efforts. With that, we're going to move forward to the PowerPoint. So our purpose for the study session today is to really introduce the substantive framework uh, and I'll call it the framework of the plan um, to the board of supervisors and to city council members. Um, and we're this is really our kickoff to our engagement effort, community engagement effort to support implementation and provide input on our first six month work plan that we will we'll be bringing back to you in January. Quickly, the I'm debris flow item is <laughs> later on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have some practice there. So, Elisa, if you could give me a second. If you are on Teams, especially if you are a guest, please remember you need to mute yourself. Otherwise, we get feedback in chambers. When, if and when you choose to speak, then it would be appropriate to unmute yourself then. Thank you. Thank you. So quickly, um, a, a little bit of an overview of the presentation. We're first going to talk about the context, how we got here. The bulk of the presentation will be a summary of the framework. We'll talk a little bit about our next steps on community input to finalize and, and get move forward with our six month plan. We'll have question and answers and then the board will take their actions on our recommendations. Um, in terms of housekeeping for the study session today, we have about 40 minutes of substantive material to share with you. There's some natural breaks in the conversation that will allow for questions. And so for those of you online, um, raise your electronic hand, please. And Christine will unmute you and, and call on you. But we will pause throughout so people will have the opportunity to engage in questions or comments about the material. So with that, we're gonna get started. I'm having a little bit of a glitch getting clicking forward. So context, how did we get here? I think it's, it's safe to say that we all understand that homelessness is a critical national state and local issue. We're not alone here in Santa Cruz. You visit nearly any West Coast community and the impact of unaffordable housing, poverty, addiction, mental health crises, healthcare crises um, is all about around us as we look at folks who are homeless in our communities. Here in Santa Cruz, we have a disproportionate share given our population size. You'll see on the graph here, in Santa Cruz County, we have almost 80 people per 10,000 residents that are homeless. And you know that is nearly double the state average. It's not the highest of all communities, but we are, have a disproportionately high number of homeless in our community. I also wanted to provide a little bit of a snapshot about what does homeless lo homelessness look like here in Sa the County of Santa Cruz. So we have uh, in our last 2019 point in time count, we had just over uh, 2,100 um, homeless, homeless people identified. 403 of those folks were chronically homeless. 151 were veterans. 419 were families, then that's about 122 households. 51 were unaccompanied children. And we had 569 who were transition age youth, so a large number. On your slide, it also shows the significance of our unsheltered population. 78% of the homeless folks in our community are unsheltered. Another important statistic, and this will come back as we talk about our, our focus and our performance measures in the, uh, proposed in the framework, 40% of those folks counted in the 2019 <clears throat> count noted that this was their first experience of being homeless. That's a large number of people who are falling into homelessness on a regular basis. I just wanted to present that frame for everyone because particularly our board has been very involved in this study pr process over the last 18 months. But I think it's important to go back to recognize what does this look like in our community? So 
how do we get here? And, and, and starting on this, uh, this technical assistance work. In mid 2018, uh, our CAO, Carlos Palacios, asked me to take a look at our county response to homelessness. And we, in, that, in that, my own overview, it looked like we did not have a systematic framework for strategically um, operationalizing the 2015 all in home for our county departments. We had no performance metrics. We really didn't have an approach to strategic data collection and use moving forward. And just generally the, um, con the, the consent or the, the conclusion around our governance and decision-making roles was that it was confusing. Roles were confusing, whether it was the county, the city, as well as the COC. And at that time we said, we need to bring some folks in to help us really get our arms around this. So in early 2019, the board allowed us to enter a contract uh, engagement with Focus Strategies. They are a nationally recognized firm that works only solely in the issue of homelessness. And they help communities look at preventing and ending homelessness through data analytics, systems thinking and stakeholder engagement. So our technical assistance engagement was to around support, to support strategic, strategic data informed inclusive system assessment and, and come up with improvement recommendations on current performance, system level measures, governance and decision structures, decision structures and a detailed plan for improvement. So I'm gonna give a quick overview of the last 18 months. We started quickly in March of 2019 and went through our baseline assessment. And we came up with four interim recommendations which we shared with the board of September, of September 2019. We initiated right on the heels of that our quantitative analysis of both our system overall as well of our, as our project performances, project performance provider by provider. And we started implementation work groups to look at those recommendations we had gotten from our consultants. And that, that and went on through March, 2020. And at that point we had our quantitative analysis and we presented that to the board on March 4th, 2020. Well, we all know what happened right after that. We were poised to go into our actual plan development and community convening, a large convening in the end of March. And we had the COVID pandemic. So during that time, everything came to a halt in terms of our assessment and our uh, improvement planning. And meanwhile, we came together to stand up our COVID sheltering system. We supported all of our existing shelter providers to put in place COVID control, controls and help them be a shelter in place program for people experiencing homelessness. We also expanded our outreach and engagement for folks who were living outside around the pandemic. So while the global pandemic and quite frankly, the CZU lightning fire caused considerable delay, it also provided us as a community an opportunity for significant learning opportunities, which influenced the framework that we're putting before you today. It allowed us to really engage in coordinated decision-making. We learned a lot about low barrier shelters and we expanded and redesigned our outreach. So here we are today with our framework. I just wanna do a quick thank you because this was an incredibly inclusive and collaborative um, approach. And so while well, the county, uh, well, the county really initiated this work through the Homeless Services Coordination Office, it quickly became a shared effort with our city partners, our service providers, community members, people experiencing homelessness. This entire village stepped up and took a hard look in the mirror and to see what we are doing and frankly, how we can and have to do it better. So I'm gonna give a quick overview of what were the findings of that assessment. Before we get into the framework, I wanna spend a moment reminding everyone of what we learned about ourselves, our strengths. We had the pieces, we had coordinated entry, our smart path system, we had outreach, 
We have shelters that were providing basic services and some with a little bit more supportive services. We have a small supply of specialty housing for those with high needs, but our gaps, we, we didn't have full implementation of a diversion strategy, a strategy to support people to avoid entering the system of homeless services in the first place through problem solving. The reality is our shelter programs were more focused on basic needs than housing. We had a low success rate in terms of exits to permanent housing. And again, our governance and decision-making were not transparent and our use of data to inform operations and get towards results, very limited. <clears throat> Basically, focus strategies helped us to understand that we had a loose, loosely coordinated collection of programs. And the assessment stressed that we needed to move to a systematic integrated approach from that first contact with someone living outside to celebrating their success at getting to housing. Again, this loose coordination worked for some, um, but not all people experiencing homelessness. And so if we are able to go forward with a systematic approach, it's gonna allow us to have a shared vision and, and objectives at all levels, that our resources and funding are aligned to shared measurable outcomes. Our programs are designed to meet those outcomes. And we use data to evaluate and adjust at all times. We'll need a clear structure and process for decisions and have accountability for results. <clears throat> and we wanna ensure that, and I, most of you know, I hate reading from slides, but I'm gonna read the last bullet. Each person receives timely and consistent response that sets them on a path to housing. So how do we do this? We're gonna do it through the framework. With that, I probably should pause before I hand it to Randy for any questions. Okay, we're gonna keep going. I'm gonna yeah. hand it over to Randy. Okay, um, good morning, Chair Caput, Supervisor Leopold and other supervisors virtual and those watching Randy Morris. And as Elisa introduced me, I'm the director of the human services department. Um, I started three weeks BC. I've been told that's what I should call it before COVID in February, and then everything turned upside down. Um, just for the board and the public to know, if you're not aware, um, those of us in county government work regionally a lot with like um, colleagues in other counties. And this baton pass from the CAO's office to the human services department is something that's under discussion all over the state. Where is the right place to house and administer this um, challenging public policy issue in county government. Um, throughout California, in some counties it's housed in the CAO, in some it's housed in planning departments, in some it's housed in um, health, and some it's housed in human services. Um, if we do this right, um, this should be invisible to the public. Um, the county is just very committed to figuring out how to administer this, and I inherited a very healthy agency thanks to my predecessor with lots of infrastructure that Elisa and her team did not have the benefit of. So I want to, before starting, just say thank you sincerely for all the work that Elisa and her team have done as a mighty team of three, um, as my team gets ready to lift this up next week with a new director and a number of staff. And we hope we can move this forward and usher this forward. Um, I also want to recognize another challenge that exists everywhere throughout California. And that is the issue of what is the role of a county and what is the role of the city? Um, there is no clear guidance from the feds or the state. Um, it's an issue that puts counties and cities at odds because everyone's very frustrated with the issue that you see in front of them. So I wanna recognize the work done before I got here and the work we need to do going forward to develop better and better partnerships. And I appreciate the work that's been to done to date. And uh, that will be a key to our success is having uh, good partnerships with the jurisdictions. Um, I do wanna make a moment to say one last um, point that is also confronting the United States and California, and that is this nexus of COVID, those experiencing homelessness and any effort at any point in time in any community to try to do better by the population. Um, Elisa mentioned, I think it was the third part in that sequence of events when COVID hit. Um, I think it's important grounding to just share a little bit of numbers and just name that this is part of what's very confounding for all of us is this dramatic infusion of federal and state money that we did not have that allowed us to do a whole lot of work with an outstanding question of what do we do when and if that state and federal money tied to COVID 
goes away. And as a reminder, the reason we have that money is because of the worry um, that COVID would spread in homeless communities and shelters and encampments. And it was good of California to invest money and FEMA to invest money to allow us to do work that we weren't doing prior and great kudos to Santa Cruz County and our city partners and our community-based partners for, with very rare exceptions, stopping the spread of COVID. And I think without the work we did, who knows what would have happened. So I just wanna recognize that. To ground that in a few numbers, um, we are serving here in Santa Cruz County over a thousand people a month, thanks to the system we stood up. And that breaks down as 200 people who are in hotels that previously would not have been. That's thanks to a state program called Project Room Key. We have almost 350 people that are in existing shelters. We did a lot of work with the shelters to make sure social distancing was in place and a lot of services were there and they became 24 seven. To allow for social distancing, we expanded shelters by opening up the Santa Cruz and Watsonville Vets Halls, recognition Supervisor Caput that tomorrow's Veterans Day and that are uh, where your office is, that we have veteran halls that are now have expanded shelter capacity to allow for social distancing. Um, we have a dedicated transition age youth program. Thank you, Supervisor Leopold, for all of your work. Uh, it's certainly a little microcosm of the challenges in communities. Where do you put these programs and your work with the community around Seventh-day Adventist? We're able to serve um, almost 20 people there. Of the many encampments throughout Santa Cruz County, the one right behind this building, the bench lands, um, at, at its peak, there was 100 people. We're down to about 50 as we're about to demobilize that with the floodplain being there. That got a whole host of services and an organized encampment with um, and, um, great success. And then I also want to highlight a lot of work, particularly done by our health partners and others, which is almost 300 people a month get outreach in encampments throughout this county to get health services, assessments, tents, sleeping bags, hygiene stations, and added up over a thousand people a month due to this infusion of money that has helped us stop the spread of COVID and homeless. So the question is, how do we take those lessons learned? And what do we do as we prepare for the possibility of that money being pulled? And what does that mean? And there's articles um, being written throughout California about the worry about what that could mean. So with that background, um, I'm gonna pick up where Elisa left off and it's somewhat symbolic because literally next week, uh, Elisa literally hands a baton to me and the office stands up that we're calling the Housing for Health to move this three-year framework forward. Um, the highlights of the framework are, it is grounded in um, vision and guiding principles. Um, it's in the framework itself that you have and the public has uh, in the um, board information online. But I just wanna highlight and um, repeat some of what uh, Elisa said actionable. I think some of these homeless plans throughout um, the state and the country often are um, ambitious and visionary, but lack what do you do about it? Um, this is actually a very actionable plan. It is a countywide plan. It pulls in the best of cities and county, all county departments that are relevant and our partners in the community. It is data driven. This is one of the things I have certainly um, absorbed the high expectations your board and community has of the department I now manage to be able to produce data to inform us and track and see how we're doing. Um, and then um, this has to be not just a word, but also actionable, the issue of equity. Um, there are inequitable outcomes among those who are homeless throughout all of California, predominantly people of color are more disproportionately impacted. And what are we gonna do to track data and pay attention and talk about that throughout um, this framework? Um, the goals, there are very detailed goals um, with very specific targets and back to the data um, uh, systems in place to measure the success. Um, all of this is rooted in very specific strategies and objectives, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, six month work plans. Um, a lot of what falls short in these big two, three, five year vision plans is the world changes. Um, the environment's fluid, funding changes, policies changes, issues change. So built into this three year framework is every six months, there's gonna be a refresh work plan, which we'll bring to your board and have community input and make public so people can see where we're focusing our effort during every um, six month stage of this three year plan. Um, and then the last one, there are many variables that are not in our control in county government or city government or in a community. So we are speaking some time to identify with the resources that are needed and identifying and naming in a transparent way what the assumptions and hopes are so that as this plays out, um, we can show if we're doing better, why, or if we're falling short, what changed? And we can be really honest and upfront about that. So that's some of the grounding principles. 
Um, in terms of some of the results, this um, significantly oversimplifies the guts of what this 20 page document is. And that is to really make a different that are results based. We want to have by the end of this plan in 2024, a 50% reduction in those who are unsheltered. Um, just to do semantic check, because the word unsheltered, people experiencing homeless things like you know, these phrases are used a lot. The word unsheltered is uh, mentioned in the lower left. That is people who are living outdoors, encampments, vehicles, or a place that's basically not home or not an actual shelter itself. And that's distinguished by overall homelessness, which basically includes those who are in shelters. So 50% reduction in those who are unsheltered and an overall reduction of homelessness, which includes the number of shelters we have by 30% at the end of the three years. So those are the overarching results we are looking for, which then moves into um, what are our goals? I'm not gonna read through this. Um, there is lots of dense um, details in the 20 page plan, but the purpose of this is to, uh, again, not just be conceptual, but actually delineate what we're looking at and track it and report on it. So if you look at what the goals are here, um, basically we want to ensure that the system itself is being more effective um, based on the host of measures which are written below. There's been a lot of discussion about how long people stay in certain programs, how long it takes to get them into specific housing slots, uh, et cetera. And this is a, a, a chart that breaks it down that we'll be tracking and reporting on throughout um, the three years. Uh, and then the second goal is um, perhaps one of the most challenging where we are most in need um, of other departments than mine. And that is how do we expand capacity? How do we expand shelter capacity? How do we expand housing slots? And that's gonna take a lot of work, but there's very specific numbers in here, which are our targets over the three years. Um, the strategies to achieve our goals, I am going to give a high level overview because this is the guts of the plan. And then I'm gonna turn it to Elisa, at least in part to give her credit because her and her team are the ones that worked on this even before I got her. So she can give a little bit of detail because I think this is the guts of the plan, but I'm just gonna frame it a little bit. So uh, of the four, number one, of those who are unsheltered or those who are homeless, which includes those who are in shelters, uh, can we do a better job? You know, what can we do to outreach to them? What can we do to engage them? And what we can do to help them not be in that situation is basically goal number one, to better connect and serve those who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, goal number two, we need more housing. We need more housing stock. We need to have a host. We need to have a number of pathways to something. Um, so there is a whole set of strategies in here about increasing the various housing options and not all housing options work for all people. There needs to be um, a different types of them for different type of people who will benefit. Uh, number three in the lower left, simply prevention. We can't just work on those who are homeless and not recognize the moment we are in in this uh, recession the challenges in Santa Cruz County and others who experienced fires, people who lost their home. We can't have people becoming homeless while we're also getting people out of homeless. So we have a whole set of strategies on prevention, diversion, trying to do what we can to stop people from becoming homeless. Um, and then the last one, um, this is uh, admittedly a little bit boring government talk, but you have to have an infrastructure to do this. <laughs> you need to have people, you need to have systems, you need to have people to track data. Um, and then to um, both this county board and to the city elected officials, there is room for us to collaborate more on how we make decisions. There are monies that come into cities, monies that come in counties and monies that come into this thing called the continuum of care that by federal funding comes into that body. And how do people make decisions about what to do with this money is uh, something we call governance. And we have some work to do so that it can be more transport parent more participatory and we can have a better process so that everyone is knowing how it is we are making decisions and how we are targeting within the framework of this plan. Thank you, Randy. I'm just, before I actually go into each of the strategy areas, I just wanna give one more sort of structural comment. So our strategies are our ways to achieve these key outcomes. And so we have four. And across those four strategies, there's 14 sub-strategies. And across those sub-strategies, there are 48 objectives. So these objectives are where the action happens. And while it's not, we have not boiled it down to that level, 
in this presentation, I will be walking through each of the strategies with some of the highlights and what's new and different. But I wanted to focus on that because we have a great all-in strategic plan. Our challenge is making it actionable and accountable. And that's really the bridge we're trying to cross with the framework we're proposing. So we're gonna move to our first strategy. As Randy mentioned, this is a really about better connecting and serving people who are experiencing homelessness, whether they're in the shelter system or they're living outside. I also wanna point out, this is where we sharpen our focus on encampments in terms of the people who are living there, but also the community impacts of encampments. That's not an element we focused on in past plans. Randy mentioned that uh, there is a capacity element here as well. This is where we need to retain some portion of that gain that we've done through the COVID shelter system. And the goal is in the next three years to be able to um, add to our existing stock. We recognize the COVID shelter system will have to be demobilized, but that we need to introduce or increase shelter capacity by 150 beds. And the target there is 130 individual adult beds and 20 family beds. So room for five families or about. Um, as I mentioned, this, this has four sub-strategies, 14 objectives to accomplish in three years. And I'm gonna address some highlights. The first two strategies, 1.1 and 1.2, are really about our shelter system. And they really came about through our COVID learning. Objective or st sub-strategy 1.1 is really around health and safety in the shelter system and maintaining our commitment to disease prevention and health across our system. It has four objectives. Substrategy 1.2 also has four objectives, and this is another COVID learning moment. This is about focusing on low barrier shelter. What we've learned through our COVID experience is many folks who are, are part of that system have not been connected with services before. And this really brings us back to that idea of 24 seven, of person centered, trauma informed, and keeping it low barrier so pe people don't end up um, behaving their ways out of shelter and falling back into the street. It's also us continuing to work on our shelter capacity referral system, something we introduced as part of our COVID response. The next two strategies, 1.3 and 1.4, are really about our gaps that we identified early in this process. The first 1.3 with three objectives is that our, up to now, very few of our shelters had um, the services to really put people on a path to housing. That's care management, housing navigation, and the goal is to have those in all shelters and having flexible funding available to help folks solve their housing problems. 1.4 is really focused on people living outside in encampments. This is around outreach and encampments. And again, an area we have not had such strategic focus in the past. It has seven objectives. This is really around housing focused outreach, not just health focused outreach, and that we need more of it and it needs to be countywide and then link homeless people to essential services. We need to train our outreach staff to have deeper conversations about housing and we need to collect data on how that's working. And then we need to work across our jurisdictions and departments to develop a shared approach to addressing encampments, particularly in private, on, proper, private, on public property and private property. Key partners to make this happen are service providers, our city partners, and our county departments. I'm gonna pause and see if there's any questions around that first strategy around better connecting and serving people who are experiencing homelessness. We will keep moving. Our next strategy is really, as, as Randy said, it's well, strategy one was around the front door. Strategy two is around exiting. And fundamentally, that we need more housing options to reach our three-year performance targets. Randy mentioned that we, uh, we have some, some goals around increasing our permanent supportive housing. That's our most um, 
folks who have the, the most challenges and, and have the hardest barrier ho housing barriers that we need to have a goal of increasing that over th three years by 100 units. And that's really uh, strategy 2.1 and working across, um, across jurisdictions to generate the, that additional supply and utilizing all different kinds of state and federal funding sources to go there. 2.2 is our strategy around increasing the effectiveness of our rapid rental rehousing programs. Currently, we have about 118 rapid rehousing slots for less than a not perfect word for families and 86 for adults. The goal in our plan is to increase it over the three years by 350 slots to really move people towards permanent housing. The third sub strategy with three objectives is really working actively in an ongoing way with landlords and property managers. Again, we need to be able to utilize whatever existing capacity we can to house folks. And the fourth strategy is around our, or sub strategy is around our coordinate entry smart path system and continuing to develop and refine that so we can uh, more act more readily prioritize housing for folks that are in need. Our partners around this are gonna be ourselves, the city, cities, housing providers, developers, and, and financing entities, as well as our communities welcoming affordable and permanent supportive housing units in their neighborhoods. We need a place to cite these very important resources. Any questions on strategy two? I have a, a question. Uh, the efforts around um, rapid rehousing seem incredibly important. When you look at 40% of the people in the point in time census uh, being homeless for the first time, that's, and that, that we've had something between 40 and 50% um, in the point in time census over the last, I don't know, uh, six uh, years um, that I can remember. And so being able to s sort of stop homelessness that's our best chance to eliminate homelessness and stem the flow. Um, and so uh, if we look at this, these goals for the rapid rehousing, do you think that that really um, is ambitious enough if we're gonna try to uh, stem the tide? Well, I think we're trying to have both um, stretch goals, but that are doable. I, I think all of us would love to increase our rapid rehousing slots be, beyond 350, but that's um, you know, a large increase already beyond what we have today. And some of that, as Randy mentioned, will be a function of funding. How do, this is not something we've done um, incredibly well to date. And it's one of the things within this strategy is how to actually offer that program better. But I absolutely, um, 350 will, well, if we are able to do that, where we will be able to achieve the goals that uh, Randy spoke to around a 30% reduction in homelessness overall, if we could do better, we'll you know, absolutely assure ourselves of reaching that and maybe we'll do better than that. But as you said, John, the, it's, some of this is really about prevention, which is the perfect segue to the next slide. So our, our third strategy is really on prevention and problem solving. And I want to just highlight that this, when we spoke about the point in time count, um, we mentioned that 40% of those uh, counted in January of 2019 indicated it was their first experience of being homeless. Another uh, Fun fact, if we wanna call it that, we identified through our quantitative analysis was nearly 60% of the folks entering our emergency shelter were entering from a housed situation. So our resource that we would hope we would be focusing on folks who are unhoused living outside, very many people are going from housed directly into shelter, which really brings us to this strategy around prevention and problem solving. So in this strategy, there's two sub strategies. And the first one is really around implementing what we call in the business diversion. And this is problem solving as a first step of smart path intake. 
This is, and the commitment here is that any person who comes into contact with the system has access to a trained housing problem solving specialist who will work with them to try and keep them housed. And part of that, and I mentioned actually in Supervisor McPherson's question around our ESG program, is us identifying funding that's available to our providers and to our clients to, to either it's to buy that bed so they can move back in with a friend, to help someone with moving expenses. It may not be rental assistance. It may be um, helping them get back to a, a family in another community, that we try and solve the problem as early as possible. We all know that prevention is typically far less expensive than those downstream impacts when someone has become a chronic homeless person living outside. The second part of that is um, in substrategy, and it has two different objectives, is really doing some analysis and focus on who is the most at risk for being homeless. And to do that, that's gonna be working across our providers, our safety net programs, and understanding those conditions, those trigger events that are happening with our community and trying to get ahead of them and really focusing on prevention. So as I mentioned, our key, our key partners in this are community providers, probably volunteers to help with some of our work, and then our, our safety net programs to really try and, and stem the tide of homelessness as early as we can. I'm gonna pause and see if there's any questions on strategy three. And during that pause, I wanna do a quick piggyback. This is something that's happening, not just in Santa Cruz County, but we are not gonna get out of this through brick and mortar housing slots alone. And we're moving programs like this within the safety net of health and human service systems and our partners that we contract community providers sometimes what's needed is to sort of help that person stay connected or reconnect with their family and or natural network and then wrap services around them to help support them in housing they have versus moving them to somewhere else. Easier said than done, it's not gonna solve everything, but I just wanna say in the prevention mix, and there are some examples of that where people don't end up becoming homeless, so they don't make them to the reports. So there is good work happening, we just need to do more of it um, as part of the prevention effort. Okay, we are on to our fourth strategy, improving administration. What we've described is a lot of work with a lot of different entities. And one of the early, um, early observations of our, of our consulting experts was we did not have sufficient administrative infrastructure to build the kind of system and take it to scale to address the level of the problem in our community. So this fourth area is really around building that administrative backbone to do this work. There are 17 objectives across these four different sub-strategies. The first strategy or sub-strategy 4.1 is really around governance and decision-making. I think there's been numerous starts and stops to this work and it's gonna have to be um, an early priority in moving forward because as we've described, the partners that are required to actually make this happen, we have to have a way to bring them together mm -hmm. to make good decisions and to be accountable. The second sub-strategy is really around understanding the view from the ground, understanding are our interventions and our programs working from the perspective of our clients and working authentically to find ways to involve the perspectives and experiences of people um, who have, are experiencing homelessness. One thing I think it's very important to stress is we have folks who have been homeless for a long time and we have folks who are newly homeless. We have working homeless. We have, a, there are many, many different experiences of homelessness and to design a system based on just one experience, we will not be successful in getting to success to uh, outcomes of housing. The th and there's five objectives within that bucket. The third sub-strategy is really around the new division and making sure that it's adequately staffed, that the six-month work plans um, are developed and uh, 
worked towards and reported on that, and that in all in those work plans that there's the, what's the investment? What's the financial cost for implementing the various programs that we've articulated? So those are all laid out in substrategy 4.3. And substrategy 4.4 is again, this theme you heard at the beginning, this idea of we've got to use data. We've got to be understanding in a very measurable way um, what's happening on the ground. And as Randy showed in that, that first very um, dense graph, this framework proposes performance metrics for various interventions. Well, that means you have to measure them and, and you have to be working with your providers on a, on a continual basis to understand what's working, what's not, and making adjustments. And the other element, one of the objectives was within this is yes, those dashboards, internal dashboards for operations need to be functional. Very, very important. And this is part of why we felt HSD was such, a, such the right place to put this work given their business analytics and their strong experiencing, experience doing that for other programs. But not only do we want that data to be used internally, we want it to be available to the public. Again, this idea of visibility and accountability. So there's a lot to do. Um, the new division is starting to come together and we have Dr. Robert Ratner joining us next week. And I will say Dr. Ratner did review the framework and was part of this in getting it um, to you today. But so the partners around this, this strategy are really cities, county departments, funders, the state, the feds, and again, our clients understanding their perspective and how the system is working for them. So with that, I'm gonna pause and see if there's any questions and then pass it to Randy. You might wanna share with the public who Dr. Ratner is. I don't think they understand. <clears throat> I'm gonna actually let, let his new boss talk a little <clears throat> bit about him. Okay. Um, we'll have something more formal, but uh, who Elise is referring to, Dr. Ratner, um, your board approved um, the creation of a new director position when to report to me as this program moves, there was a community hiring process with city and community organizations and businesses and a whole process. And Dr. Ratner was lifted up as um, the person to join us. He's got over 20 years of experience. He's a, a medical doctor and has a public health degree. He's been working in this field for 20 years in the guts of it for a very long time in county government, particularly in health and behavioral health. So he will be joining us uh, starting on Monday. And um, I appreciate the board for doing that because then we have somebody with a lot of subject matter expertise who's worked you know, in the middle of this. And, and just because I know Santa Cruz is a very intimate place, um, his wife is a graduate of UC Santa Cruz. Uh, his father-in-law is a professor emeritus from UC Santa Cruz and he's spent with his kids uh, much of the last 20 years in Santa Cruz uh, with his family and his in-laws. Uh, so this is a sort of second home to him. So that was part of the draw to be able to be here and work in a smaller community where he could head wrapped around how to take this on. And as Elisa said, he was a unpaid volunteer helping us between jobs <laughs> over the last few weeks. So thank you, Robert, if you're listening, I think he is. So I wanna add one other thing about Robert. So not only does he have that focus on behavioral and medical health, he's also done housing development. As we know, that's, you know it's great if we're, we're addressing health needs, but we also need to get people housed. So we're really looking forward to having that expertise. Are you ready for your next slide? I am. Um, okay, so we're almost gonna close it out and open up to the board questions and public comment. I, I do wanna start um, by sharing uh, uh, on assumptions. You know, one thing that really strikes me um, in my pr previous position, I sat in many board meetings and hearing board members talk about homelessness and frustration and city councils frustrated and counties and cities pointing fingers. And I was on a lot of committees. And so I've come here and some of the energy is very similar. The community is rightly so very, very frustrated. Um, it's, it, you know, it's unconscionable that there is this many people who do not have a home. And what I find before diving into the specifics of assumptions is it is so hard for a community member to know where to point the finger. <laughs> um, in public policy work, sometimes you talk about uh, causes and symptoms and homelessness is a symptom of um, a complex set of causes that have played out arguably over three decades based on federal policy, state policy, county policy, city policy. So to untangle that puzzle and figure out where you point a finger, what do you do is 
a very, very complicated task. And my point is, as a segue to assumptions, a county can only do so much, a city can only do so much, a county human service department can only do so much. So there are a number of assumptions we have in here because we don't have control over a lot of variables out of our control. And I do wanna name, even if county and city get along fabulously, we still are gonna need um, federal and state policy mandates and funding to, to really, really move this needle. So we're gonna have to do a lot of lobbying. Um, so some of these assumptions, well, we have this double crisis of you know the fires that have led to a thousand houses being lost, the pandemic, which has led to a recession that has led to lots of financial complications which contribute to this issue. We clearly are in the middle of a complicated federal presidential election. And you add all that up, how will that impact the current housing market is a major variable that we can't really control. But um, during the three years, how that plays out will have a big impact on these outcomes. Um, as I mentioned, state and federal government are gonna have to play a role. Uh, counties and cities can't shoulder this all by themselves. This is a crisis hitting almost every community throughout the United States of America. You can't therefore assume it's created by a local community. It's, it's federal and state policy and funding that have contributed to this. So we need their assistance. Um, I'm not gonna highlight, we need a lot more staff, a lot more infrastructure and a lot more resources. Again, triple kudos to Elisa and her team for managing it on the shoulders of three. I'm gearing up for this. It's gonna be on the shoulders of seven or eight, including Dr. Robert Ratner. And I'm sure we could do better if we even had more. So we're gonna be paying attention, being very thoughtful about um, public funds and infrastructure needed uh, to we put as much money towards services, but we're gonna need some infrastructure as well to kind of do this and track this well. Um, partners prioritize available funding, code word four. <laughs> there are other um, systems that get funding who have choices to make. And sometimes those choices don't go to housing for the most vulnerable with the lowest income. They go to other groups that don't move the needle on homelessness. I do not judge that, but I just recognize that that is not in our control. So, you know, planning offices at city and county who have to confront planning commissions and constituents and citing issues and you know what to do when money comes into other systems is not in our control, but how those partners prioritize will have an impact. Um, you know, then extension of that common housing developers and service providers in this community, which is different than the community from where I came, um, there is not as much um, uh, system in place. So we have to help support um, our providers having the capacity. And if they don't, we have to work through that. Um, so the last two here, I'm sitting in front of elected officials. Um, this um, very complicated issue of siting. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so city of Santa Cruz, city of Watsonville, Scotts Valley, uh, Capitola, and here to the board with the almost 50% um, unincorporated footprint. Um, I have empathy for the challenge you confront when constituents and planning commission say not my backyard. Um, and what do we do if we can't work through those issues? And as Elisa mentioned, there is no places that we can cite places to create affordable housing. Um, that is an assumption that we need the support of electeds at city and county to help us work through. Because if we have money, but we don't have a place to cite it, what can you do? So that's gonna be something we need to be honest and transparent um, about as we work it through. Um, and then the last is, you know, I, I just kind of to close out the book end of my opening comment about how much is out of our control. <coughs> At the risk of oversimplifying an issue and bringing the human element in here, um, I wanna just name that I've only been here eight, nine months. Um, it's a remarkable place to work. There's a lot of positivity and assumption of positive intent. And there's a lot of tension between cities and counties and even within county departments around how we focus on this vexing issue of homelessness and how we communicate, how we work together, whether we're gonna get in the same boat nor in the right direction is absolutely in our control. And if we finger point and fight and strategize about who, why somebody else and one other group is doing it wrong, that's in our control to stop. It's like president elect speech um, the other night, let's kind of let's work together. So that segues to a little bit of a slide with a little boat in the background. Let's all get in this um, and or together, everybody, you know, what do we need to do on the left is a big, big summary of sort of what we went through um, and how to get there and the success that which is in our control is whether or not we work in partnership. That is easier said than done. It's a word, it's a statement, it's a phrase, but we do need to maximize our ability to collaborate. I think there is some room for improvement, but we have a good foundation here. And this just lists um, all the parties, including electeds here and the city electeds, um, others, people with lived experience. 
lot of community partnership, uh, city and county staff and, and, and business partners as well and investors. So that is our hope. And I think we segue to, um, I think we probably should pause, pause there before we segue before to before we go to the next out. steps. Okay. And we have a couple. Um, I hear, I hear we'll, someone. We'll pause for that. Yeah, Ms. Benson and, and Mr. Morris, this is a supervisor friend. I, I thank you for the presentation. I actually do have a question that I think is relevant to bring up at this point, because we were speaking on kind of a broader point of community based partnerships. I view the four strategies as four individual legs of a chair. And if any one of them weren't to succeed, then I think the whole system that we are presenting here uh, would be ineffectual. But within those strategies, there are things that the county clearly has agency in, ownership of, or really just sets the stage in, but a lot of things that we, we don't. And while Mr. Morris, you, you allude alluded to that to some degree, and I'm looking at the slide that, that speaks to this. I think that this, this point can't be overstated because there tends to be um, a focus on an individual entity to resolve something as people feel it fits within the purview of X or Y. And I do think that the county is taking an ownership role and leadership role on this as evidenced by the creation of the new office and what we're speaking about today. But what I would be interested in hearing is are more specifics beyond, uh, as you had said, this work in partnership are words, but within either these six month breakdown periods that we get these updates, realistically, in order for this to succeed, we're going to need to know how these partners are also playing a direct role in this. Um, otherwise, I think we are going to end up right where we are now. And so I'd be interested in hearing how actionably the community-based partners, both the other cities, which I, I'm very grateful for seeing so many of them participating in this uh, meeting right now virtually, uh, as well as the community-based partners, but to a, a lesser degree them and to a greater degree the actual other localities, how you anticipate having them play a very active role in this process. I'm going to take a little bit of a, a stab at responding. I, I, Supervisor Friend, as you mentioned, part of it is really how we put together those six month work plans and articulate roles and responsibilities within that. So I, I think that has to be one of the one of the cornerstones of the designs of of those structures. Uh, the other thing is where we prioritize the question, the overall question of governance. Um, this is something, there was a, a start before I started in 2017 to, to revamp the, the, the broad governance and priority setting uh, around this topic. We started down the path in our, one of our work groups in this, in this um, most recent effort as well. And, we, and it, it's a very, it's, it's both straightforward and complex at the same time. And I do think the focusing on that early in this three, three year process to really better articulate and understand roles and responsibilities and shared decision making in a very formal way will be part of that critical immediate work. I'm going to see uh, if Randy wants to add anything. Yeah, I'll, I'll be I'll be a little more specific. Thank you for the question, Supervisor Friend. And this is a hypothetical example about the process and the bridge we need to build between this plan and when we come back to your board and hopefully all four city councils early in 2021 is then we'll have our first six month plan. Um, so the process would be if we have funding that could allow us to develop some affordable housing and there's potentially unincorporated that's in board and city or board uh, county planning and planning commission process would be we would want to talk to Kathy and the planning commission and your board and get agreement about putting on the six month plan. We have a in this next six months an opportunity. If it's in a city jurisdiction, we would want to work with the city, pull the city in, talk to them, talk to their planning department and do no gotchas, no ambushes, but work together to identify the potential. And hopefully when these plans get lifted up, we name who those parties are. They agree to being named in there. Um, and then we track it and we report it openly and transparently um, in city council meetings and at the board. And then 
there's more people engaged in the process, not just us. Um, I hope that's responsive to your question, Supervisor Friend, but um, that's an example because the siting issue is so complex for elected officials in city and for you all in county, that that's one where we, we just wanna work with those entities to name it and be willing to participate and have a role in the six month plan. And then we'll work on it, talk about it, report out on it as the plan rolls out. Is that responsive to your question, Supervisor Friend? Yeah, Director Morris, it, it is responsive, and I and I didn't mean to articulate that the sole responsibility falls on the county, or that I have a concern with that, uh, in the sense that I feel like every jurisdiction will always feel that they are disproportionately um, burdened by certain processes, and uh, that that is just natural for when you represent a certain area. Certain areas will feel that they they take a disproportionate load or responsibility. Uh, be it one of the two major cities, I should say, in our in our county or the unincorporated area. Um, so I, to broaden that, I, I think that we can all recognize that that is going to come back to be an obstacle, that um, any individual jurisdiction is going to feel that they're shouldering more than the others. But with that said, I, I just I, I think that I did hear what I needed to hear, which is that we would break this into a six month actionable plan process. I just think that that we we have a borderline Sisyphusian issue in coastal California with the cost of living and overall land use challenges that have led to a massive amount of, of homelessness within our community that doesn't exist, excuse me, within our state that doesn't exist in a lot of places across the country, even though there has been increases rate, increased rates across the country. And so what I'm saying is that I, I feel like that I need to be assured that if we're taking the lead on this, that everybody does have a um, a, a responsibility within these other jurisdictions to to really own the fact that none of the, that it's going to this responsibility has to be more than just shared. It has to be owned across uh, these jurisdictions. And so I think these six month check ins are going to be very honest and soul searching about whether or not we're meeting these markers in a way and how we can shift uh, this trajectory because otherwise it's just a, a a plan that goes up on a shelf which nobody wants. Um, and so that's that's what I'm hoping in these these six month processes to really get those accountability measures for all of us, for me as an unincorporated representative, but also representing some cities and for city council members and others that just represent their individual jurisdictions. This is uh, Supervisor Coonerty. I have a question. I'll have comments later and appreciations uh, for our county's leadership's efforts in this. But uh, my my initial question is we had uh, we have some funding coming in right now. We'll hopefully have more funding coming in in the next month or two. And I want to know, you know, how we make sure that we're applying the principles and approaches that are being called for in this um, in this focus strategies report to that money, even though we may not have a full, we may not have adopted the first six month plan or the action plan we had two items on today's budget um, on the uh, consent agenda that reference this. And I wanna know how we're gonna start doing the work now um, as money comes in, even though um, even though we may not have adopted the, the strategy and the work plan yet so that we can start to make progress. Um, Supervisor Coonerty, we are guilty of being presumptuous that you would support this plan and the money that's coming in is being is coming in within this frame. And we are already queuing up for the first two months of the new office, gearing up for coming back to your board and to city councils with a six month plan that shows how we've purposed that money within this frame. And that is actually part of this first six month plan. So we are already doing it um, based on the discussions that have come forward both publicly and in meetings with your offices that this is an agreeable approach and framework. So we're already doing it basically is the answer and you can hold us accountable and the public can when we bring come back in early 2021 to show how we've done it and how it looks in that first plan. I would let, wanna add one other thing to this um, conversation. When we started this work, I'm, I'm hearkening back to a conversation I had with HSA Director Hall, my dear colleague Mimi, who said, we need this framework. So it's not just sort of the work of the homeless system, but the other um, systems of care that they then have something to look at and identify how did they relate to the goals? How did those investments, either new or current, relate 
to this framework. So there's another, it's, it's, it's maybe a little bit removed from the directness that, that Randy just spoke to where it's, it's specific funding that's articulated for homelessness. The other <clears throat> intention of this framework is to provide a basis for us to look at our other systems of care and how they are connecting to this framework. How are, how are our behavioral health dollars being leveraged to support the work here as well? So it's, it's as I mentioned, it's a little bit more of a construct um, but it's something that we can now use and start with to evaluate each and every investment moving forward and is it moving towards these goals? So I think that's one other important advantage of what we're the proposed framework today is it allows us to look at these other funding streams and articulate, are these aligned? Are they not? How do we do that? Great, thank you. I'll save my comments for, uh, for after after the community has a chance to comment. Oh, are any other questions before? I, I had oh, a question sure. or two. The, you mentioned, uh, Mr. Morris, that uh, you know you've already uh, um, looked at this framework as as we th seek these additional dollars, and I wonder if you could just say under this new framework. You know, uh, uh, 18 months ago, we received uh, 10, 11 million dollars. How will f the, uh, the, if the next slug of money that we get for that, how will that look different? And the allocation of those resources different than the way it looked last time? Um, very good question. Uh, I would like to think one part of the answer is it's more transparent. It's more clear to use a word you um, very politely, but directly asked us to consider more digestible uh, so that when this money lands, it's in this frame, <coughs> there's data tracking how we're doing on it. And when we come back to you in January, you'll see it in that frame in a plan. The plan is digestible and people can track better because right now it's a kind of a mystery. Money went into some big amorphous system and is doing something, but it's hard to track it. So I would like to think it will be more clear how the money came in. Um, and to oversimplify the $9 million that Supervisor McPherson asked about earlier and Elisa responded to, you know, that really kind of breaks down in terms of helping make sure we have funding to keep this COVID system in place that is serving, as I said, almost a thousand people a month and not pulling the rug out from under them for a very defined chapter while purposing the balance towards a number of these four, um, three strategies. Um, so I hope it lands in a way that just fits within this and people can track easier. And I'd like to think, um, and Elise has mentioned this and I've certainly felt the pressure and expectations to have better data that we will be able to be very upfront and preemptive about where we are in the process, how the money has landed, and are we moving the needle and talk about um, what more we need. I hope that's what happens. Yeah, I mean, we th this has a very ambitious goals, right? Which is which is good, and uh, I know that there will be a sufficient amount of sweat between now and three years from now to make sure that you achieve those goals. Um, but there will be. It, it seems that the state, which has not replaced our source of funding for affordable housing that was lost when redevelopment uh, the agencies were eliminated, is just coming through with this one-time funds, and it's not something that we can count on to know that we're going to get. X number of dollars each year. It's it it varies. It, it changes. It um, there's new foci by uh, 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 the administration. You know, so it's it's difficult. Um, but it sounds like it, uh, future funds um, will also be th th those decisions will be made by all the jurisdictions together. These these partners that you've listed here. Um, I. Well, let me answer in two ways. One is for money that comes into the county or the county COC, um, we would like to have the partnership with city jurisdictions. Cities get some money too. We'd like to have them in partnership with us that it's all in this frame. And that again, it's more transparent, it's more open and it fits within the tracking. But I think the second part is um, it seems inevitable with the nature of this crisis throughout California and nationally we can also do a better job parsing out what needs federal and state intervention and concurrently focus on lobbying, looking for philanthropic funds, going after grants as we do now, but more. And I think 
I think, I don't know about DC, but California is hungry for solutions to this issue. And it's just so complicated to find one. If, if somebody can move the needle well, I think people are willing to invest in it. But right now they don't know where the investment goes because it just drops into a big amorphous system. So I just want to underline the importance of being organized and focusing on our state and federal lobbying as well. Uh, the, the last question I'll ask for right now is, uh, you mentioned this in terms of looking at all of our other systems of care funding, and we're gonna be doing an, a new round of core funding uh, uh, sometime next year. And so uh, in the first time we did core funding, we used the all-in plan as sort of a guidepost of how we're gonna make decisions. Um, would you assume that we're not gonna use that plan, but we're gonna use this new uh, housing for a healthy Santa Cruz as our guidepost for those housing decisions? And how, you know, how uh, w do you think about um, those, all the other investments that we make the being linked in, in through that core funding program and will our partners see it the same way? Ooh, that was a multi-pronged question. <laughs> um, I, short answer is yes, of course, we have to have this be the frame because uh, this is the replacement frame. Um, the next set of slides, which are the penultimate slides before public comment, um, you'll see a reference to core. We want to engage our partners. Um, and then how will they see it? I obviously can't speak for them. Um, but I think you know this is one of the things that's fully in your board's control when you have discretionary general fund money. And I think we'll just, again, try to be very transparent. Um, we will be back in front of you. Um, we have a deferral item. We'll be back in front of you in early 21 talking about the process building up towards um, next summer when we put that RFP out under your guidance. So all of that can come together. And as you know, we've been doing a lot of work with our core partners to try to build some consensus towards this movement we're working on. So I hope it will fold together nicely, but I obviously can't speak for them. Their community organizations are struggling quite a bit. So I think I understand their struggles with needing more money because they could do better if they had more money, but that's the challenge. There's not enough. Thank you. I would just wanna add one more point to, to Supervisor Leopold's question around connecting the dots, money dots with this. When we were looking at the original heap dollars, there was all, we, we, we went through a, a local prioritization process because we recognized within sort of the, the HAP community, the COC community, that we were putting together proposals that just basically chased the funding requirements of the funder. It wasn't based on local priorities. And I think one of the critiques of our heap decisions was we didn't have something like this to drive what we were going to do. And that, that we had literally just started this process when we had to make those decisions. So I, whether it's core, whether it's state dollars, whether it's federal dollars, this provides us our own local structure. Of course you have to align with, with funder eligibility and requirements, but it's finding that sweet spot between the two and having a structure as specific and focused as this will just make that, hopefully make that process cleaner as we move forward. Thanks. So Chair Caput, if there's no other questions, we have one last set of slides before we open it up to questions and public comment, if that's okay right. for now, okay. Okay, so I'm um, just gonna close out with next steps. What, what is this all for? If you can go to the next slide. Um, we now are basically sort of, you know, unveiling this publicly um, and we'll say in the next slide to cities as well. And it creates an opportunity for stakeholders to kind of look at this, um, you know, ask questions, get clarification. Um, but also really what we're hoping for is within this frame to sort of help us together collectively as a community figure out how to focus. Our first six month plan is going to be drafted and brought forward to your board and the city councils um, in early 2021. Um, and then this is a little bit of a call to action. Um, mindful everyone stretched thin, um, the more who are able to help support us and be part of the solution, the better. So we also hope that this process identifies um, partners who are willing to be part of the so solution and can kind of invest in the work with us together. And that leads to the last um, slide, which is just kind of want to outline the timeline that's in front of us. So here we are today um, at this study session. Um, 
we, uh, Elise and I will be co-presenting at the four cities, uh, two tonight, unless something changes, uh, Santa Cruz and Watsonville. And then we have um, Scotts Valley and Capitola uh, later in the week and next week. Um, during November and December, we mentioned these opportunities for community input. We um, will be sending out and make it public um, an online survey that anybody can respond to and give information. We'll be collecting that. So that will be put out, we hope by the end of the week. We do have a process in place that we're gonna be connecting with people who are experiencing homeless now to do some in-person social distancing survey. Um, and then this is where I go back to Supervisor Liebold's question. Um, we are still working with focused strategies on having a series of virtual meetings with key stakeholders. And one is this core entity that has been meeting for the last many of years to get their perspective. Um, the HAP, uh, we're also specifically back to equity, really engaging with the South County provider group because the dynamics in Watsonville and Santa Cruz are very different. Um, and then our goal is to come back to your board and to the city councils to sort of finalize this plan, which we hope to put a little bit of nice graphics in and have it be the official plan and the first six month plan to honor you, Supervisor Leopold, digestible, <laughs> understandable, um, something that we can track, and then that will be the focus of our work. So that is where we are, um, and I believe that closes the formal presentation, and Elise will come back after public comment and just remind your board of what the actions are today. Yeah, I, uh, let me, uh, I'll ask, um, I don't expect an answer for everything. I'm gonna make a comment and then you can answer just a little bit because we, we're, this is a study session and I know we're going forward. Uh, I wanna thank you for all the work you have been doing. Uh, we're being proactive and we're trying to, uh, you know, solve a problem that is a very difficult one to uh, deal with. It has a lot of moving parts. Uh, what, I, what I'm uh, uh, kind of concerned, the longer we're going forward and the longer we're expanding or whatever, uh, the more responsibility we have personally. So I, I'd rather be kind of proactive on some things uh, rather than waiting till something goes wrong and then all of a sudden we have to deal with that. So w one would be, I guess, security in the, in the future uh, with the shelters, I know the Watsonville shelter, they're doing a great job. Uh, we've been in there, uh, uh, the shelter's been in place for months now, uh, probably about six months, is it close to? I think we're closer to seven. We right. opened that in April. Yeah, and then they're doing great. Uh, but uh, we do have men, women, and children, uh, young ages, all in one building. So. If something does go wrong, one of the children or something gets hurt by somebody or, uh, and the showers, we have the men's showers and the women's showers in the same, uh, you know, open gymnasium area. Uh, so I, I guess what I'm getting at is, as well as it's going, we, we have to have, uh, we're, we're owning uh, responsibility now uh, as time goes by. So uh, a little worried about staffing. Somebody does maybe show up and then you only have what, one or two at night there because somebody called in sick or whatever. Uh, so we, I guess we need more staffing and a little more security, but again. And then uh, the high school is right across the street. We have some of the homeless that don't want to uh, live in a shelter because there's rules. And so they're camping out across the street at the high school. And right now the high school doesn't have any students, so it's not a big deal, but it will become a big deal in the future. Uh, the other would be uh, normally with uh, affordable housing, you have to have a minimum amount of uh, income coming in uh, to even qualify like section eight or uh, whatever. And even with Section 8, uh, there's government assistance helping pay the rent and everything like that. But the person has to have some kind of income to you know, add to it. We're talking about people, uh, almost all of them uh, have some kind of income coming in somewhere or they don't. Are there a few that are gonna fall through the cracks here? We're talking about people that are basically homeless, but 
that because they can't handle money that they have coming in or? I think we have, you know, a variety of, of, of experiences in terms of income levels um, with our homeless um, residents. Some are working and it's really the cost of housing here. Some are not and are gravely disabled. And those are our candidates for things like permanent supportive housing. So as Randy talked about, as the report talks about, we have to have a variety of housing options to address different income realities. And when we talk about something like permanent supportive housing, that's for folks that really are not able to live independently and don't have the economic means. But some of the other things we're talking about is really around just affordability. And again, that question of how do you have, um, how are rents affordable and how are they subsidized? So as we look at our housing supply, that's gonna be part of the questions we get at. We're gonna to have to have a lot of different housing products to address the different levels of income. Okay. And then uh, what about, let's say I show up and I have, I'm from another country. I have no documentation. Uh, I only speak a, a different language. Uh, and uh, how am I gonna qualify to, to get some housing there? That's, really a, difficult. that's a very good question. I think we have lots of different experiences um, with, with folks coming into our community, immigrating in and, and how they access services. But as we know, you know, the status of someone's documentation definitely can be a barrier to accessing services. You bet. And the last thing, I don't expect, uh, like I said, answers on all of this, because uh, it's a study session. But if, uh, uh, let's say I'm, uh, when, I, when I'm talking about, we're becoming like the landlord, we're becoming like the owner, we're, we're actually gonna own certain responsibility in the future. Uh, and so I, I have a house, let's say, and I open it up for section eight but I allow the house to fall into disrepair or I allow garbage to pile up or I don't run it well and I don't fix things quickly, then I'm, then I'm responsible. I'm very responsible. So what I'm getting at is as a board of supervisors and as a county working on these problems, we own it. We own the problems. We own the, the fact that Hey, how come we have so much garbage piling up? Because we have more and more coming in. Uh, uh, we uh, we have you know health and safety. We've got uh, we've got to look at that real close so we don't become a bad landlord. I guess. Okay. So I'll let that go. I'll open it up to the public for comment, and uh, we'll go ahead and uh, vote on this item. Come on. How you doing, Marilyn? Oh, sitting here so long over an hour, Marilyn Garrett. Um, I have given, we're working in a, a system of capitalism and that's the problem. Um, and I've given this to the board before and I wanna give this to you two presenters and that was very uh, informative. I learned and uh, some new uh, figures there. Feeling sad and depressed, it says. Um, are you anxious, worried about the future, feeling isolated and alone? You might be suffering from capitalism. Symptoms may include homelessness, unemployment, poverty, hunger, feelings of helplessness, fear, apathy, boredom, cultural decay, loss of identity, loss of free speech, incarceration, suicidal or revolutionary thoughts and death. And um, I don't know what can be solved in this system and it's only gotten worse with this COVID. And there is a quote here from uh, um, Rocco Galati of the Constitutional Rights Center in Canada. And he quotes the University of Maine's Germany study. 14 countries with little to no COVID measures feared no worse 
and mostly better than the countries that impose COVID measures. And Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s website, Children's Health Defense, he comments on statistically when there's more unemployment, there are more deaths. I don't- Give her another minute. Give her one more minute, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just sitting here an go hour ahead. and a quarter here. Um, because of these restrictions, the hunger, the poverty, the starvation, suicide, increase in domestic violence, et cetera. Many more people, he said, will die from this than from any virus. So here we are in this situation. And I don't really, what I've been reading, there's no evidence that masks and social distancing and all this really helps. Uh, Chair, could we keep anything. the housing? So uh, may I finish, Mr. Leopold? And you talk about healthy Santa Cruz. We also have, you're focusing on homelessness, an unhealthy environment with all of the wireless microwave assault on everybody causing mental health issues and ill health. We also have all these disinfectants and poisons and pesticides. When you talk about healthy Santa Cruz, it's important to remove these known sources of harm. So I'm gonna leave you with a copy of this. And um, it's a system problem. Thanks, Marilyn. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I'm a resident of rural Aptos. Thank you, Ms. Benson and Mr. Morris for the excellent report. And I really applaud the county um, getting things together. So there's an over, overarching plan that will um, move forward. And I really like that there will be a six month work plans where everything is evaluated for flexibility. And I really like that you're working together with the cities. Uh, I've heard a lot of complaints about that at the Santa Cruz City uh, Council meetings. Um, one thing that I think this board can do is really look at increasing the percentage of required affordable inclusionary housing in new developments. Um, under, we're still working under Measure J with a 15%. Watsonville City has 20%. Why, why don't we increase that um, requirement for a higher number of units in inclusionary in new development for inclusionary housing. We need to look at tiny homes being part of the solution. And that's not really been addressed by this, uh, this county, by your board. And that is something that could happen. Um, the problem with the ADUs in the mid county is the high cost of new water service connections with SoCal Creek Water District. It's from um, $22,000 to $30,000 for a new hookup, and they require a separate connection for ADUs. So that's a problem, and I think that we need to be talking with our water districts about addressing that issue, that barrier. I want to, um, boy, there was a lot of material, and I only get one chance to ask questions. I want to, um, confirm that there have been no cases of COVID in our homeless populations in this county. I hope that that is true. Um, but I have a, a, a concern about um, the project room key allowed the county to rent hotel rooms. Project home key would allow this county to buy the hotels. Is that something that this county can really afford to do and maintain going forward as a permanent solution? I want some clarification on that because I worry. I appreciate the good and very frank questions and answers about the, uh, how the $10 million grant was used. Nothing got built. It went, all went to non-governmental um, services and nothing really changed in terms of providing housing. So I, I appreciate Supervisor McPherson's question, how are we gonna spend the $9 million now coming in to really make a difference? 
I really uh, applaud your um, questioning the use of that money, especially when people have come here and complained about Encompass lying for contracts to get housing. And that's never been addressed. Mr. Tony Crane has been here many times. We well, I'm out of time. I have a lot more questions. Three minutes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Hi there. Yeah, hello there again. So I complained already about mental health department and asked for investigation because of kidnapping, slavery, brainwashing, and um, mismanagement is outrageous and about housing um, my daughter was in line for voucher section 8 since uh, 2008 she had a diagnosis like learning disability and as soon as i moved in here after my daughter had traumatic brain injury to help her out with health insurance with everything the county was pushing us, me away and try to isolate my daughter away from me. This is what they were doing constantly every day. And my daughter never was able to get voucher section eight. So when the mental health department made my daughter very sick, incredibly sick because they kidnapped her, they isolated her and uh, misdiagnosed her, mistreated her. So after that, my name was added on the voucher section eight because my daughter lost her ability to be independent because of brainwashing. And they, anyway, housing authority did not consider my daughter's request in the verbal, written, written request, nothing. Never her request was considered anyway. Whatever she asked, they just uh, disregarded it and denied it. So my daughter was homeless until March this year. Nobody can even believe it that it's possible and happened in this county, which stole my daughter from me and even concerned her three times, you know, but still she was not even considered for any housing. She's still not in line for affordable housing. And now they finally gave her voucher section eight this year on March after my again complaint after complaint after complaint. But now they're trying to get that voucher away from her because she cannot handle her independence anymore since she was made sick by the mental health department. So I need help, do you know, for my daughter housing right now. And uh, the county actually prohibited to anybody to help me. I even prohibited to get any legal help. We have senior legal aid. When every time I go there, they just don't let me even to schedule any appointment. They know me in face. I am prohibited to get any legal help and to help my daughter as well. So this is my request to get my daughter on somehow on the note and help you do not lose voucher section eight that she was waiting since 2008, 12 years. Okay. If I may like get a card. Thank you. Is it possible? Okay. Okay, we'll bring it back to the- Chair, we actually have one web we comment. We have a comment. This is from Serge Cogno. Good morning, my name is Serge Cogno. I am an organizational consultant for homeless services. I am on the county's mental health advisory board with Chairman Caput. I was a member of the city of Santa Cruz community advisory committee on homelessness. I have been on our grand jury. I'm a member of the newly formed neighborhood courts. I created Stepping Up Santa Cruz Homeless Service Directory. I'm an executive director of the new recovery cafe Santa Cruz that we hope to do a presentation to the board in upcoming meeting. I want to express my great appreciation and respect for the staff that supported bringing this framework forward for, for focused strategies for leading the way and for all ready and focused in doing the hard work in this plan. I appreciate the desire to solve homelessness without judgment, to offer safety, compassion, and willingness to see the actual people in our streets who are unhoused, those looking for help and those afraid untrusting and resistant to receiving help. We are, um, what, I'm sorry, what we must admit in this 
is that our community has voices of compassion and following best practices, which have been proven outcomes nationally and internationally, as well as voices that lack compassion, that deny best practices that always go away. You are someone else's problems. As director Morris said, we need to, co to collaborate, to collectively move forward with this framework. We must admit that some of our ordinances, both city of Santa Cruz, county of Santa Cruz, targeting those experiencing homelessness. The county still has 9.36.080 County ordinance banding overnight car camping on county roads through the Coastal Commission, though the Coastal Commission wrote a letter notifying the county that this was not allowed. We must admit that the County of Santa Cruz ordinances and ticketing of those forced to live outside makes this makes the inclusion, the engagement of the housing of them possible. Forgive me, but what I could not find in this framework, though, I saw focusing on the low barrier and in our shelters and focusing on training and housing for our outreach staff. What I did not see in this, sorry, what I did not see in this framework is how the city and county ordinance and law enforcement citations and not allowing those forced to camp outside to find a safe place without continually being moved along because we will, because we will do, I'm just gonna read it the way it's written, because we will do not have enough shelter for everyone. Without being offered adequate and consistent bathrooms, shower and trash services, we will also need to move forward to support this amazing framework. It's treating, is treating those not in any of our programs with dignity to encourage them to join us on the path towards housing. These are hard conversations and the community voice is actually making the achieving of our goals more difficult. I want to thank Focus Strategies, Elisa Benson, Randy Morris, and all of the many, many staff of the county, of the cities, and the nonprofits, of the faith community, and those on the streets who are willing to dream and are willing to step together to achieve the goal in this framework. Be safe and have a great day. And that's the last comment. You bet. Okay, thank you. Uh, that'll conclude uh, public comment. Uh, bring it back to the mo uh, board either well, I, for- I think uh, uh, Ms. Benson, Ms. Benson was gonna give us one last slide about the recommended actions. Thank you, uh, Supervisor. Yes, so the recommended actions are, are on the slide. Obviously we've done number one, we've conducted the multi-jurisdictional study session. And the second is to move forward as with the engagement process that Randy uh, detailed for, the, for all of you. And then uh, coming back no later, then the first meeting in February, we're actually aiming for the end of January for the final adoption of the, of the framework and the first work plan. Uh, Chair, I would uh, make that motion. Okay. We have, uh, we have a motion. I'll second, second. I'll second the motion. I just have a comment to make too. Well, you go first, uh, Supervisor Grunity. <laughs> sure. So first, I just want to take a moment and appreciate the work of uh, Alyssa Benson and Randy Morris on this. Um, this is an issue that uh, <clears throat> for a long, too many years, um, jurisdictions have pointed the fingers at uh, each other or uh, other entities. Um, and because it's such a hard problem, no one wants to take responsibility. I want to appreciate the work um, and the leadership that has been shown um, by the county to step up and say, let's look at our system, let's look at what's working, what's not working, let's look at what strategies work in other places and what we can employ here. Um, I wanna acknowledge that um, we're talking about uh, setting a concrete goal uh, to reduce the number of households experiencing unsheltered homelessness by 50% and the number of households experiencing hom uh, experiencing homelessness by 30%. Uh, that's a big goal, um, but we have um, a, a series of uh, approaches that I think uh, will be meaningful. Uh, and the fact that all this was done during COVID um, and continues during COVID, I think has both been um, a challenge, but also informative. We now have more housing uh, and more sheltered than any of us ever thought possible uh, a year or two ago. Um, but we also see that with all that shelter, the problem is still getting worse. There are still more encampments, um, still more families suffering and still more community impacts. 
I think recognizing that we will never be able to uh, construct enough shelter for those in need, um, that putting people on a list uh, that uh, in which they will never uh, get the housing, a list to nowhere, um, and instead saying, let's use the resources uh, and relationships that, uh, that you have uh, as an individual. Let's help you repair them. Let's give you the tools um, to help rebuild those relationships and find housing, whether it's here or other places, um, is a much more humane and effective approach to, to addressing homelessness in our community. Um, and uh, and I appreciate the efforts. I don't think it'll be easy. I think um, there will be times when we set these goals and we come up short, but um, as long as we are trying and iterating and, uh, and changing to adapting circumstances, um, I think our community and especially those experiencing homelessness will be better uh, will be better served. And so I want to appreciate uh, where we are today and look forward to where we'll be tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chair, uh, I appreciate uh, the remarks that my co my colleague just made. And I also want to thank um, the staff for their work in putting this together. It has taken longer than thought because of the unusual nature of this year. But it does represent uh, uh, the latest effort to try to, to think about how we do homeless services differently so we can have better results. Um, I was on this board and participated with the Smart Solutions for Homelessness um, in the creation of the All In Plan, which involved hundreds of people in the community and which uh, had a, a series of bold goals uh, to eliminate uh, homelessness in Santa Cruz County. And one of the, uh, of the, the uh, and, and that was adopted by our board in every jurisdiction. And one of the requests that that, uh, that, that um, report made was that we have a uh, person responsible for homelessness, uh, our homelessness response situated in the CAO's office because at the time, that's where the community felt w was the best place um, uh, to address these issues, to, to raise its, its, its visibility. There were a lot of other requests in there for other jurisdictions and, and uh, the, um, the ambitious goal of, I think 6,000 units of housing, you know, it's, uh, uh, I think everybody realized at the time that they were probably overly ambitious, uh, but there was a, it started to me a, a change in the way we thought about doing things here in Santa Cruz County. And um, the efforts that county staff has made to, to try to form a governance structure so decisions could be made, um, but with all the jurisdictions, it's in some ways it sounds boring, um, uh, work, especially hard for the public to understand, but obviously critical. So everybody's working on the same page, that they're investing resources to the same goals. And the focus strategy process to me is a, is a better way, it has proven, I think, a better way to, to try to incorporate those voices. So our partners uh, feel a greater stake in the plan that uh, we've uh, identified um, three or four key goals that while ambitious, you know, with stretching could be accomplished. And, um, you know, there's lots of strategies and goals and, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the plan makers love those things and, and that's great. But I think is to, to uh, Mr. Morris's point, I think this, it's easy to understand how about how we're gonna eliminate uh, or how we're gonna add to the housing stock, how we're gonna work to reduce the number of people who are uh, experiencing homelessness in our community. Those are things that people uh, can understand. So I really appreciate the hard work that went into getting to that place. I do think that in the future, it's gonna take leadership at every level to help accomplish these goals. Um, uh, ensuring that there's resources, um, uh, in standing up to, uh, to site uh, new housing projects, uh, to, um, to do the hard work of working together 
and building that coalition um, to collaborate rather than uh, to point fingers. Those, that's, that, that's, that, that's work that in part can be done by staff, but is also a requirement of elected officials. Um, I think we do have uh, elected officials who are committed to these tasks um, and are willing to put the time in to make it happen because the public demands that we address this problem uh, as successfully as possible. So uh, I appreciate the work that went into this plan and I look forward to seeing how it rolls out over the next couple of years. Thank you. Okay, great. We have a first and second. Bruce has his hand. Bruce. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Chair, can you hear me all right? I'm um, Supervisor McPherson. Um, I want to thank, as editors have, the uh, County Administrative Office and especially Assistant CAO Lisa Benson and our Human Services Director Randy Johnson. Welcome to the county, Randy. It's uh, nice to have you here at this time. Um, I, I know that uh, it's going to be difficult to keep on track, but I do think this having this six-month review is, is vitally important so we know uh, where we've been and where we aim to go in the future. Um, I think the promise and potential of this plan really relies on the roadmap it provides for the county as well as its four cities and our service partners uh, in the nonprofit world to work together to make a meeting meaningful progress be, be, uh, toward prevention to begin with and then working uh, diligently to get those who are homeless back on track. Um, I think the true success of this plan is going to be how we operationalize these strategies and ensure that each of us stays committed to owning our own role in managing the outcomes. Uh, we have built some flexibility into the plan as well as frequent reports back, as I mentioned, uh, that to ensure that this happens. I, I um, want to call out two goals that I think are really important that goal one, four C, to deepen the outreach to people experiencing homelessness in a way that includes problem solving or barriers to get them housed. Even when they're presented with a pathway to housing, not everyone can get on right get there right away and for a variety of reasons. So we need to meet people where they are and problem solve to lift them out of this homelessness. Um, and then goal 4F, um, to clarify public property rules regarding encampments. This is a big gap that contributes to the visibility of people living on the streets. And I would go even further with this goal to say that we need to seek the adoption of common practices and protocols within local jurisdictions regarding the outreach and enforcement so they are uniform throughout the county. Uh, this would get us on track to a cooperative effort with our four cities. And I think this is um, this would be a, a welcome addition if we had some pra uh, common practices and protocols to follow. And I think that there are some included here, but I'd, I'd really like to just highlight them even more. I think this framework is a great start and represents a contract that uh, uh, we are making with the community to do things better together. Uh, I want to thank all those who have contributed to this. To this point, I think it will help us get any kind of grants from federal or state officials in the future. And that's one of the uncertainties we face is we don't know how much funding we're going to have to carry out some of these ambitious programs. Um, and I think that it is an ambitious goal to uh, reduce uh, those unsheltered by 50% in three years. Um, and to let people know, we that if we did that, we still will probably have some homelessness out there. But if we accomplish that goal, it will be a tremendous accomplishment, and we're going to get there if we work together. Uh, so I really look forward to working with our city partners, and uh, and reducing this uh, this era of homelessness that we're all experiencing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, any other comments from the board? If not, we'll uh, call the roll. Call the vote. We're going to call the vote. Thank you. Supervisor Leopold? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Chair Caput? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, should we take a quick break or should we? Yeah. Okay, well, we'll take a 10 minute break. 
And then we'll come back with item number seven. Well, Chair, uh, uh, I, I don't know. I know that there are people here for the, well, I don't know whether people are here, what we're gonna get to before lunch. I think we should be clear about what we're gonna get to and not so people in the audience know. Okay. What do you, uh, what's the expectation? We do have, yeah, we're gonna have closed session and lunch. So we could, um, we need to take up the 7.1 and 7.2 that we took off the consent agenda, as well as item seven, the stream clearing ordinance. Um, we could take up the other items after um, okay. we come back from the break. So, so we'll do we'll do the uh, the ordinance, the urgency ordinance before lunch, and we'll do the rest of it after lunch. We can take up the CAO off uh, presentation and the appointment after lunch, after the public defender item. That's correct. Okay, I just want to be clear for everybody who's here and listening. All right, ten minutes. So a 10 minute break with everybody back at 1140 then chair or 1145. Okay. 1140. Thank you. Okay, uh, item number seven. You might wanna check if your microphone's on. Yeah, item number seven, consider adoption of an urgency ordinance adding chapter 7.142 to Santa Cruz County Code, allowing the director of emergency services to authorize clearance of stream channels on private property addressing immediate threats to life, health, and public safety related to debris flows stemming from the CZU August Lightning Complex fires as outlined in the memorandum of the deputy CAO and the director of public works urgency ordinance adding SCCC chapter 7.142 and if we, uh, uh, I want to thank Marilyn for uh, these cookies. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Uh, thanks. Ready? All right, good morning, Chairman, Supervisors, Matt Machado. Uh, the item before you as read is the Stream Clearing Urgency Ordinance. In order to protect the health and safety of the community, it's necessary for the county to be able to quickly and efficiently remove and clear sediment and debris from creeks and streams. The urgency ordinance before you authorizes actions necessary to enter private property and work within the stream channels in order to clear sediment and debris. The recommended action today is to adopt an urgency ordinance adding chapter 7.142 to the Santa Cruz County Code to allow the Director of Emergency Services to authorize clearance of stream channels on private property to address immediate threats to life, health, and public safety related to debris flows stemming from the CZU August lightning complex fires. And uh, with that, I can answer any questions you may have. <clears throat> okay, great. Uh, uh, any questions from the board members on this item? Yes, Mr. Chair, this supervisor friend, I do have a brief question of, of Director Machado, um, fully supportive of this item. I have a question about maybe broadening it, coming back, uh, supporting this today, but and maybe this is a better question for council, but it, it seems to me that we should have such an ordinance in place for any declared emergency where we would have this authority. Um, obviously in the South County, we, we do have private property interfaces with creeks, streams, and the river, um, that it strikes me that it, that it would be more efficient if we had an ordinance that during a declared emergency, we could go in and do this work anyway. Is that something uh, that would be beneficial to public works to come back with an ordinance uh, moving forward that gave you authority for that moving forward? There, uh, this is this is Jason Heath. Um, we did look at that issue uh, when we were in the midst of, of, of putting this together. And uh, what we what we decided uh, from a legal perspective is that uh, it, it's, recommended to do a much more tailored um, 
uh, ordinance to directly address the issue at hand whenever you're going on to private property to address something. And that's one of the reasons why, for instance, that we uh, uh, kept it to this particular topic and why the ordinance is only going to be in place uh, through uh, next June, I believe, unless uh, the board decides to extend it. Um, so I, I, I think that uh, uh, perhaps uh, we could talk uh, a little bit more about this um, after you've, you, you've considered um, uh, the options. Thank you, Council. I have no other additional questions, Chair. It, it looks like uh, Supervisor McPherson has hands up. Yeah, I just had a comment that um, I, I'm fully supportive of this. I know it's related to private property, but I just wanted the general public to know that uh, property owned by the San Lorenzo Valley Water District up in Boulder Creek, uh, we have a big concern up there on debris flow, and they have um, cleared the choke points there. And so uh, that's a good step forward. I just wanted the public to know generally that was just completed uh, this week, I believe, or the end of last week. Um, and we had our public works department and, and a lot of people engaged in that. So uh, this is something that I'm fully supportive of and I'm, uh, I just wanted the public to know about that issue up in Boulder Creek. Thank you. Any other board member? Okay. Uh, no other part. Okay. Uh, I, I will now call for public comment. Hey, Bob. Good to see you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Caput, members of the board. I'm Bob Berlage. I'm here on behalf of Big Creek Lumber Company. Uh, our company uh, is completely supportive of the county's concerns regarding uh, the dangers of post fire uh, stream flow buildup. And we're hoping that, you know, there may be ways that, that we can assist. Um, I lost my home in the fire along with most of my neighbors. So it's, uh, it's too close to home for me. But um, we have a couple of questions. I'm hoping that council or Mr. Machado can answer these questions before you move forward with this ordinance. The Santa Cruz Sentinel had an accompanying article this morning where they stated that the county can get reimbursed for this work. I read through the ordinance this morning and couldn't find anything about reimbursement. Uh, Sentinel may have been, been mistaken, but if there is reimbursement, it's important to know what that means. Is that reimbursement? in the form of grants from state and federal agencies to the county? Or are they talking about reimbursement from private landowners for work that the county does on private property? If it is that, then I'd argue that the specifics of that reimbursement from landowners needs to be in the ordinance with an opportunity for people to look at that and for landowners to provide public comment before you pass the ordinance. Uh, that's the first thing. Second thing, our company has personnel and equipment uh, and the ability to deal with debris flows. And I'm just wondering how this ordinance uh, could potentially impact our ability to do that, or even if we'd be allowed to do that. And lastly, the ordinance calls for workers, uh, county workers, perhaps state workers, federal workers, or even subcontractors could go on the property to, to uh, accomplish this work. We have a question about the liability of people that the county has sent on to private property. If someone's injured on those properties conducting that work, is the county solely responsible or does liability lie elsewhere? I'm sure that's a concern that uh, not only Big Creek, but other landowners would, would want to know. And lastly, very curious how the county is going to ascertain where these debris flows occur, because a lot of that stuff's up in canyons and not very accessible, certainly not visible from roads. So I'm curious how that's going to be uh, 
um, information is going to be developed. So um, we'd like answers to those questions and I'm happy to answer any questions that your board might have. If I may, Chairman, answer some of those questions. So I, I heard four questions in there. Uh, the first one is with regard to reimbursement. And so it is not uh, reimbursement from private landowners. We would be pursuing reimbursement from state and federal sources if a disaster declaration does happen. And this ordinance does uh, allow us that, that um, ability, which is helpful. Uh, the second question was, um, was the um, liability, I believe. And so uh, that liability will fall on the contractor that we hire or on the, con on the county of themselves, uh, if it's our own forces. Um, and then what was the, I think I missed the second one actually. Can we, can our company and our equipment oh. personnel? So uh, with regard to that, I think coordination with uh, local forces such as theirs, um, we'll always entertain that if, if there's an opportunity. And so, um, Maybe we could coordinate on that. Uh, extra resources is a good thing. And then uh, I think the last question was, what was your last one? Uh, oh yeah, the location, thank you. So the, what we envision this to be helpful for is if debris flows, especially some of the smaller ones start coming down these channels and creeks and they hold up at roadways, culverts, bridges and such, we want to be able to clear those. Now those, those debris uh, blockages are on private property, but they're up against the roadway. So we'll see them and we wanna clear those before they build up into a larger dammed type situation with a larger potential of threat downstream. And so we'll be focused on the ones that are up against roadways and, and, and such infrastructure that we maintain. So I think that answers the questions, thank you. Thank you, my name is Becky Steinbrunner. I live in the mountains too, and I'm sorry for um, your loss, Mr. Bellage, and for everyone that lost their homes. Um, I appreciate the questions that Mr. Bellage asked. I uh, continue to have concerns that the debris flows are being modeled on what happened after the Thomas fire in 2017 in Southern California. I pointed out to you before that we are in a different habitat. The redwood forests are different. Um, there is already a lot of sprouting going on out there that will help hold the soils. So I urge you to take a, a cautionary. Uh, don't assume that that's gonna happen the same as it did in Santa Barbara. That's what I wanna say. And to that end, I'm concerned that I didn't see anything in the language of this urgency ordinance that private property owners would be consulted with the plans on clearing. I didn't see anything about um, the resource conservation district, which has gone out and, and told people not to remove trees, to let them stay and um, that has been my experience too, working with that agency in my rural community, that um, opening up stream channels allows the water to move very fast and can actually cause more damage. So I, I appreciate the clarification from Mr. Machado that the focus will be on uh, culverts and bridges. And I wanna know that that is the only place really where these, this, the state, federal contractors, county workers would be working and not going on to private property to clear stream beds, because that's how I read the documentation in the packet. I wanna know how the, um, how the work would be prioritized. And I'm assuming now that you will prioritize monitoring and clearing at culverts and bridges, but will it be more extensive? And if so, how will that be prioritized? Going back to Mr. Borlage's question is, how would these debris flow areas be identified? And I wanna say prioritized. 
Um, I really appreciate council's uh, uh, respect of private property rights. And I, again, want to say that we need to include the property owners in any plan to clear because they know the, the land, they know the drainage, they probably already know where there could be problems and getting the, the resources to help do work that may be needed would be the best. But I cringe at the thought of federal, state, and contractors just coming in on private property and doing what they want to do without the property owner's consent or input. Thank you. Hi, Marilyn. Hi. Yeah, as I was listening, I had some of the very same serious questions that are uh, needing to be responded to before something like this is passed. When there are these urgency or emergency measures, how many have we got now going in the county? Um, I, I think it enables policies that, um, are very questionable. And um, the w w conservation group Becky was mentioning and others who know the ecology of streams and what's to be done. Culverts, bridges, blockages on the road, that makes total sense. And that's what the county should do. But um, where are the property owners on this to um, give input or even know? I mean, uh, and we in this country, you know, it's like, oh, private property is so sacred. And yet this seems like a, a violation of those private property rights. Um, so, um, those, those are very questionable to me. And I have a friend who lives by a stream. I don't, but there are creatures there that, you know, come by and um, I don't know if they're beavers or, uh, you know, what they'll block. The, the river changes course each year where she lives, depending on the rain, the waterfall, how things move, and it's just constant. So to think of someone coming in who doesn't know the river or have a sense of the ecology and just go in, there have been like increased flooding when things are just cleared like that. So seems like this needs to be put on a future agenda after these serious issues are really looked into and, and resolved. Thank you. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Any other comments? Yes, we have a couple web comments. The first one is from um, Jessica Peters. Dear Board of Supervisors, I urge you to vote no on this recommended action. What prevents measures, what pre I'm sorry, what preventative measures are being put into place ahead of the rains? Forcing people out of their homes multiple times is not the answer, nor is tramping on citizens' property rights under the guise of public interest. It is unreasonable to continue to use the events in Santa Barbara County to push this agenda. The conditions and geography do not compare. Thank you. And then we have one from Ken Davenport. Dear supervisors, why do we need a new ordinance that allows county workers to enter private property and declare a nuisance? Last year, a planning department inspector was caught red-handed on video trespassing on a lady's property. I believe he was fired, but why would you vote to sidestep current citizen protection in the county code? In a bona fide and declared emergency, the government has all the authority it needs to enter the property. I do not support this, mm -hmm. and you shouldn't either. Thank you. And that's it. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a quick question, uh, Jason, uh, on an ordinance such as this, uh, does it require four fifths or does it Yes, does? yes, supervisor, this I, is a I'm four fifths vote. I'm assuming it's gonna be unanimous, but I'm just curious. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, if we have no more discussion, we'll bring it back uh, for a motion and a vote, uh, second. Uh, I would move the recommended actions. Okay. Second. And we have a second. We call the uh, vote. Supervisor Leopold? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Chair Caput? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. 
Uh, that'll take us to item number eight, consider report on the uh, Chair Caput, of... we're gonna do 7.1 and 7.2. Yes, 7 7 oh, we'll do eight uh, after the break, this, later on this uh, afternoon. 7.1 is for the consent items? Yes, yes. it's yes, normally item 21. Yeah, you're, right. you're right, okay. Uh, 7.1, uh, removal of, uh, we put them together, uh, 21 and 23 uh, for comment uh, on, uh, I think you probably need to read affordable it affordable housing on Capitola Road. Uh, Chair, do you want to read it in or do you want me to read it in? Yeah, you go ahead. Uh, accept and file the report on the use of property taxes received by the county related to the disposition of the Capitola Road commercial site as recommended by the county administrative officer. And as the board of the of supervisors for the Santa Cruz County Redevelopment Successor Agency approved revised affordable housing and property disposition agreement by and between the Santa Cruz County Redevelopment Successor Agency and uh, Midpen Live Oak Associates LP, a partnership between Midpen Housing, authorize the county administrative officer to execute the agreement and take related actions as recommended by the county administrative officer. You're the one who pulled the item. Uh, I don't know whether you had questions that you wanted to have addressed. Uh, I, I pulled it for the transparency part, but uh, it, 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 I like the, uh, I'm, I'm, prob I'm going to probably vote yes uh, because it, we're going to clean up a mess that's uh, been there for years. But anyway, go ahead, uh, open it up for any comment. Uh, go ahead, uh, Becky. Yeah, could you please wear your mask over your nose? Thank you. My name is Becky Steinbrunner, Supervisor Caput. Thank you for pulling this, these two items. They are in tandem. And it, um, I, I wanted you to bring them to public discussion because this is a serious matter that needs public discussion, not just shoved under the rug on a consent agenda. The problem I have with it is the contamination that was uh, discovered um, that's put out in the document as an attachment the, the contaminant is um, PCE, it's a carcinogen. The studies have determined that it's in the water, the groundwater for the area. The studies have determined that it is extremely high levels of the contaminant. It's perchloroethylene that sticks around. It doesn't degrade in the soil. It is, it is taken into the body via breathing via soil, via showering in, in the water, and via food. This affordable housing would sit right on top of it. I looked on some of the environmental sites and the main cause of people getting um, affected by it are from buildings sitting on top of contaminated sites. Now, Supervisor Caput, you've said that the county's gonna clean it up. That's not what I read the county would put in a vapor barrier and just seal it off. How do we know that that vapor barrier would be effective? And it's not addressing the contamination in the groundwater. The problem I also have is the numbers that, of contamination that were reported. In the initial two borings, the levels were 8,200 micrograms per meter squared. The second boring was 40,000 micrograms per meter squared. The state allowable limit for commercial buildings to be in sites like this is 67 uh, micrograms. For residential, it's 15. Look at the levels we've got here. So that caused some other borings to be done. In the groundwater, it was found to be 192 micrograms per meter square. And the maximum contaminant level allowed by the state is five. I don't think we should be forcing poor people to live here. My other concern is that Mid County, Mid, Penins, um, Mid Peninsula Housing has not shown in the documents that they will have the funding moving forward to make sure that they continue to monitor this problem. That is the problem stated in the EPA documents that is a persistent um, failure that there isn't funding to move it forward. It will be permanent funding that they have to have for the vapor management um, monitoring, but that's not shown in their operational budget. 
I also have questions that the county is going to loan the developer three and a half million dollars to develop this land, more a million and a half more than it was. The county has also agreed to reduce the cost of the land by a million and a half because of this contamination. Who's gonna pay for this? <laughs> the county has to pay, but I don't see that happening. And with the county's finances the way they are, I don't see how the county can afford it. By reducing the amount that you get from this land, you're also reducing the taxes that you would get. And that's part of 21. I also, in closing, I just want to say an important part of this was the historic preservation. And there is absolutely no mention at all of requiring that to be in there. I have a lot more questions. Zero tax credits. Um, Thank you. It's, it's, uh, please put it on hold. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. Well, that's a major disclosure of research that Becky has done from the documents in the county that to me seem imperative that you uh, put this on hold. Uh, just, and I think when we hear cleanup, when things are toxic forever in the environment, you might move them around or put them in the air, but they're still there. And I've mentioned before to you how I was part of the lawsuit in 1969 to ban a lawsuit of nursing mothers to ban the carcinogenic pesticide DDT, which is long lasting. I was horrified. We all had DDT in our milk. We all have contaminants in us and baby's umbilical cords are loaded with something like 200 different chemicals. These productions, this harm should be prevented in the first place. And once it's out there to put it where it's gonna contaminate more, seems to me just, um, j just more deadly. So I think this does need to be put on hold. That should not go forward. Uh, put, and I also have a friend who grew up in an area where the housing was over contaminated soil and she suffers all kinds of ill health effects. So this is plus the county, our taxpayer money, incurring more costs for a project that um, seems like it should not proceed at all. So I, I, you know, I see Becky come here, she reads through the documents. And what I would like to see is the board, like previous boards, I remember when Marty Warmhout was chair of the board of supervisors, because I've been coming here 20 years. And she really examined the issues the facts, listen to the public, put things on hold, didn't proceed with projects that were detrimental to the people and the well being of this county. And I would urge you to follow in her footsteps. This should not proceed, in my opinion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Could staff come forward and just address the issues about the environmental um, uh, monitoring and the plan for cleanup? Uh, good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. I'm Peter Detlifs, and I'm representing the Office for Economic Development. And I'm joined with Joanna Carpin from Mid Penn Housing and Suzanne Issa from County Housing. Um, and uh, so in January of, of early this year, uh, Mid Penn, as part of their development, uh, completed a phase two environmental analysis on the site and discovered the dry cleaning solvents. Um, through uh, the course of working with Weber Hayes and the Regional Water Con Quality Control Board <clears throat> from the state, um, we have uh, gone through a process of identifying, uh, characterizing the extent of the, uh, the contamination, as well as developing a, a method to mitigate and um, the, the contamination for the project, as well as ongoing monitoring and management. Um, and so, 
um, as part of that, uh, we are discounting the price of the land for MidPen to assume the cost of the mitigation and the ongoing monitoring and management. And, and that plan has the approval of the Regional Water Quality Control Board? Correct. And our Environmental Health Department? Correct. Uh, was the contamination in the, in the past caused by, what was it a dry cleaning? Uh, facility or something so the source of the contamination was a dry cleaner located on the <clears throat> excuse me on the adjacent parcel and it's our understanding that since the discovery that the the water control board is uh in communication with the uh, owner of the neighboring parcel and working on a cleanup plan with them will we and, be and seeking how long ago was that uh, that it's not been used oh the, the yeah the dry cleaner closed sometime in the 70s yeah it's been operating as a laundromat since then. Will we be uh, seeking any remuneration from the neighboring property owner, which is the source of the contamination um, for the contamination of our property? So uh, not at this point. Um, I mean, at this point, the, the Regional Water Quality Control Board is working with the property owners to find grant resources for them to do the cleanup on their site um, because they don't have the resources in order to do the cleanup. Um, well, I think that we should do, you know, that we had hoped to actually develop that property as well. And maybe if they were willing to do a good development, that would be an opportunity to clean up the site as well. Right. Uh, that would have a benefit to the entire neighborhood. Correct. Um, um, the, in the water quality control board analysis, do they feel as though the people who are living at this uh, site are in danger? So this kind of contamination is very common. It's one of the most common in the state. Um, and most um, you know, urban developments at this point um, are often de dealing with cleanups from gas stations and dry cleaners. And um, in fact, MidPen is working on other projects right now. Do you want to speak about that? Sure. I'm a little short. Um, yeah, so thank you guys so much for, for taking this before and thank you for all of your leadership and support in affordable housing in general and also here at 1500 Capitol Road. Um, to reiterate, you know, the purchase price reduction does include, um, it does include not just the cost for the foundation, which is this, this vapor mitigation system is actually the preferred form of mitigation for contaminants of this type by the water board and by DTSC, the state, state agency as well at this time, since that's been for the last handful of years, this is their preferred measure. We're even going a little bit above that. Um, and we are going with the more active foundation system. This, this foundation system will trap this is for all of the buildings on the site, not just the affordable housing, so for the clinics as well. Um, the foundation system will trap any source of off-gassing of this, um, of the soil, and it will also have monitoring. So to that question, there is, um, the purchase price reduction includes the construction cost to create this foundational system that would trap and make sure it does not go into the buildings, as well as reserves to account for a 30-year monitoring plan uh, associated with this. So we have gone through great lengths and we really appreciate the county has worked, staff has worked with us so closely in making sure that we are working closely with the water board in hand. And so we've gone through this every step of the way with all partners on board, making sure we are doing everything up to the levels and standards that we would require at this site. So thank you again. Yes, given our, uh, given our earlier discussion today about the difficulty um, in uh, securing housing and having a variety of housing opportunities uh, in our community, um, uh, this site becomes uh, as important as any site that we have here in Santa Cruz County. This is not trying to pull, put something under the rug as has been uh, claimed. This was all the information that was shared with us today was available in publicly available documents in which the, 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 um, the uh, mid-pen housing and two health clinics um, who serve their, uh, their clients um, uh, fairly well and care about their clients have reviewed this information with their own environmental health experts and the regional water quality uh, board has approved a plan of mitigation. Um, 
it's not taking it unseriously, reducing the price by two over $2 million to ensure that the agency has enough money for a long-term maintenance uh, and mitigation of this um, is incredibly important. And that will mean loss of revenue to the county, which would have received 18% of that money. It means loss of revenue for the school district and the fire district and the library who would have received a portion of this money. Um, but it's important that Midpen Housing and their LP uh, uh, would, would have the resources necessary to, uh, to create this foundation and mitigate uh, this problem. Yeah. This, this is gonna be a great resource uh, for our community. And to that point, I would like to highlight some of the community benefits uh, associated with this project. The, the partnership is a really innovative partnership between Midpen Housing and also Santa Cruz Community Health and Dientes Community Dental. The new site will be providing services, uh, health and dental services to 10,000 county residents, as well as 57 uh, homes for low income families, of which, and to the point from the study session earlier, 15 of those units will be for, pers for supportive housing. And so it is a really valuable resource and we, I just want to reiterate that, that, this, that there is a lot of benefit to this for the community as well. Yes, this project went through extensive public discussion. It involved hundreds of people. Uh, we approved this in November of 2019 and it would be under construction if not for the discovery of this contamination and the planning necessary to protect people uh, from this contamination. To believe that, there, that, that, uh, that somehow we're trying to pull the, rule, the, the, uh, the rug over people, you'd have to believe that Midpen Housing doesn't care about the people that they serve. The Santa Cruz Community Health Center don't care about the people that they serve. The Dientes Dental Clinic doesn't care about they serve, and the County of Santa Cruz doesn't care about they serve. It's not realistic. It's the kind of conspiracy thinking that blocks projects. And, it's, and, and as we mentioned earlier, in the siting of projects, people always look for something to stop projects. This is a good project at a great location and will be a welcome addition to our community. I move approval of both these items. Anyway, uh, thank you for showing up for uh, and sharing the information here on this item. I appreciate you coming. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, we have some web comments. We do have a motion. We have some web comments first. Okay, yes. This one is from Laura Marcus. I am re I'm writing on behalf of Dientes Community Dental Care, a partner of Santa Cruz Community Health and Mid Penn in the development of the property at 1500 Capitola Road to establish a health and housing hub in the heart of Live Oak. I am writing in support of consent item number 23 and approval of the AHPDA. We have been working together since 2017 to establish plans for this property, holding community meetings to gather neighborhood input, working with the County of Santa Cruz to establish appropriate use of this site and with our boards and donors to ensure funding is in place for a successful implementation. I am confident that we are the right partners for this property and this project to serve the community. I cannot stress the importance of approving this item today as it will impact our ability to move forward with the purchase permitting lending and start of construction on a timeline that will impact many funding milestones. Thank you for your partnership and your consideration. Laura Marcus, CEO, Dianta's Community Dental Care. We have another one from Leslie Connor, as CEO of the Santa Cruz Community Health, I am writing in support of consent item number 23. This has been pulled for further discussion today. It is fitting that your board's approval of the AHPDA follows such a lengthy discussion on preventing and reducing homelessness in Santa Cruz County. Three partners at the 1500 Capitola Road Project, Santa Cruz Community Health, Dianti's Community dental and mid pen housing are all committed to promoting the health, safety and prosperity of the low income members of our community. Our project plan includes increasing access to high quality integrated health care for 10,000 people a year, plus 57 units of affordable housing that are sorely needed and play a part of the county's strategic 
strategy to increase housing stock. Santa Cruz Community Health serves homeless individuals plus families, children, seniors, and all people without regard to age, income, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, sexual identity, or any other circumstances. Due to critical funding, benchmarks, and significant planning and expense that are currently underway, we are working hard to secure site ownership and permit approval so we can break ground in April 2021. We cannot afford additional delays at this time because such delay delays may cause us to forfeit funding that is imminent. We respectfully ask the county to continue to support it, continue its support of the 1500 Capitola Road development by approving the AHPDA. This effort will have lasting impact for generations to come. We sincerely appreciate the collaboration and support of the county supervisors and staff have shown us to date. Thank you, Leslie Connor. And that is it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Chair, we actually need I, to take this as two, when we go to a call for a vote on this, we need to take this as two separate motions, not, we cannot combine both of them. Okay. So if we can take it as 7.1 and then the next one is 7.2. So a motion on 21 and a motion on 20. Correct. Yeah. Okay. I think Supervisor McPherson wanted to weigh in. Yep. Hi, Bruce. Well, I, I don't know if the, the Supervisor Leopold had made the motion on 23. I was just going to second it. Um, if that's proper, or do you want to go to 21 first? Uh, well, let's do 21 first. I'll make the motion on uh, on item the recommended action to accept and file the report on uh, on item 21. I'll second that. Okay. We'll call for. Supervisor Leopold. Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Sup Aye. <laughs> McPherson? Aye. And Chair Caput? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. And on, Motion on, 21. Well, I 23. On, on the, yeah, I, I would just say recently I had uh, 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 Betsy Wilson on, on my town hall and I likened her uh, to Indiana Jones. And you remember that scene in Indiana Jones in the first movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark, where he's in a cave and he's gonna grab the statue. And then all of a sudden the arrows are flying and the ball is rolling and the, the earth is opening up. That's like um, affordable, building an affordable housing complex. There is just hurdle after hurdle after hurdle uh, that is presented to you in order to get it done. Uh, sometimes they're not very dramatic. They, they involve uh, funding uh, hurdles. Uh, sometimes they involve uh, neighborhood uh, backlash. Uh, sometimes they're environmental, uh, but there is never an easy path. And there's never a affordable housing developer that goes in and says, yes, I'd like to do this. And everybody goes, yes. And they throw money at it and it gets built. It takes a lot of work. Uh, we should be proud of the work that we did uh, to engage the community find a project that, that's gonna actually contribute to the uh, health and welfare uh, and address our housing shortage here in Santa Cruz County. Um, and I'm confident that, that the, uh, this environmental issue has been addressed seriously and safely for the people who will live there. I move approval of what was formerly item uh, 23 in the recommended actions. Second. Okay, uh, we'll call for the vote. The Supervisor Leopold. Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Chair Caput? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, we'll now go to item number- Chair Caput, we'll I think a... we're gonna take a break for closed session and lunch. We are session. scheduled to return at 1.30 for item 11, and then we'll take up item eight and nine. Okay, that'll be fine. And there's nothing reportable out of closed session. Uh, pardon, uh, is there's there no, there's no, no reportable item out of closed okay. session. Thank you. Uh, we'll come back at 1.30. Uh, I need your help again, John. I'm, I'm ready to back <laughs> you up. It's item number 11. Uh, you want me to read it in? We're gonna do, go to eight. We're gonna do no. We're gonna 11. do. We're gonna do the one thirty uh, scheduled item. We're gonna go to eleven first. Eleven. Okay. okay. I, item number eleven. Consider approval and concept of ordinance adding chapter two point one three. 
to the Santa Cruz County Code to establish a public defender's office and a position of public defender, schedule the ordinance for second reading and final adoption on November 17, 2020, and direct the county administrative office to continue to work with key stakeholders and return in February 2021 with a detailed transition plan as outlined in the memorandum of the county administrative officer ordinance adding SCCC chapter 2.13 public defender. Uh, any questions from board members on this item? Uh, Chair Kappa, I have a presentation <laughs> yes, and then we'll okay. go to public comment and your questions. Okay. Um, so good afternoon. I'm Nicole Coburn, Assistant CAO. I'm joined here today by Principal Administrative Analyst Sven Stafford, and together we're going to walk you through a very brief presentation. This is our agenda for this afternoon. Um, we're going to provide an update on board direction from the October 6th meeting and information that we were asked to provide. Then we'll go over the ordinance that's being proposed today and discuss recommendations and next steps. Sure. So just as a reminder, on October 6th, the Board of Supervisors um, heard a presentation from our office on transitioning towards a public model. And during that meeting, the board provided some additional direction and requests of us. We were asked to meet with the criminal justice partners we were also asked to work on creating a clear hiring policy for the existing staff within the public defense firms. And we were asked to report on um, what California counties are meeting national standards and the cost of meeting those standards. And we were also asked to return in November with an update. And that's what we're here to do today. So since we last met with you, um, we have arranged weekly meetings with our criminal justice partners. We've so far met four times since October 6th. Um, this includes the Big, Bigham Law Firm, the Conflicts Law Firms, the Superior Court, the Criminal Defense um, Program, and personnel, our personnel director and our county administrative office. Um, everyone who's been participating in these meetings, um, I believe have really appreciated the improved communication and the outreach to everyone. Um, everyone we've walked through and been very transparent about our plans so far and asked to get some feedback from them on those plans. We're trying to address you know, any concerns that they have before we come back to the board with a, with a final transition plan. All of the partners in these meetings have read or are in support of the ordinance being proposed today so that we could start to move for, towards a public model. Um, the work underway has been to work out a detailed transition plan. Um, we're trying to work through addressing the concerns raised with the process for hiring and retaining staff within the firms. Um, and addressing what that might look like for the Bigham firm as well as the conflicts firms. Um, discussions are well underway on staffing and we're also trying to figure out the best timing of the public defender recruitment. Um, like I mentioned, we presented our plans as we had proposed them and the partners have responded with their concerns and we're trying to find consensus um, by the end of this calendar year and work on an item to bring back a more detailed plan next calendar year in February. So I'm gonna turn it over to Sven, who's going to discuss um, our research on the national standards. All right, thanks, good, thanks Nicole. Uh, good afternoon, board. Uh, so, uh, to address a couple of the other directions from the October 6th meeting, um, we did do research on 11 other counties with uh, uh, public systems that we thought were similar and represented, uh, you know, close comparisons to Santa Cruz County. Um, none of those 11 publicly report caseload standards uh, of the handful that we were able to talk or email directly with. There was a general fear of those uh, data being um, misunderstood by the public or potentially misused by, um, by other uh, law firms in attempts to potentially get their boards to um, 
you know, favor a contract model away from uh, a publicly funded model. Um, there was one, uh, one county similar in population that does have a public model that, uh, that did say they took national standards and uh, use those to guide their local standards. Um, in doing so, they have, uh, they have a standard of attorneys closing out no more than 400 misdemeanors per year and attorneys closing out no more than 100 felonies per year, with, which tracks fairly closely to what the national standards are. Um, and finally, in, uh, in Fresno County, which is a historically underfunded county and um, doesn't compare to, to Santa Cruz County in that sense, uh, they did settle with the American Civil Liberties Union a couple years ago. And in their settlement, uh, they are required to meet those national standards and report quarterly on those. In terms of funding a public office, um, we were asked to come back with the cost of uh, fully funding the 6AC recommendation. Um, a couple of caveats first is that we still believe that we don't have good enough local uh, caseload data to, uh, to make the staffing determination. Um, we, we do believe that we need to um, bring the attorneys over, get a caseload management system and build, uh, build those local standards. Um, there's additional uncertainty created right now by uh, the diminishing caseloads that are able to happen in the court due to COVID-19, uh, some changes in the state law. Uh, additionally, a lot of the caseload impact cited in the 6AC report was in the misdemeanor uh, filings. Um, currently, the district attorney is embarking on a neighborhood court program to hopefully reduce the amount of cases that even get to the misdemeanor court. Uh, so that could have, um, hopefully would have a, an impact on the number of cases and the caseloads going forward. Um, on the other side, there is uh, just continuing complexity uh, created by the you know, extensive digital profiles that people are creating through emails and phones and, and other, other devices that makes uh, trying cases more complex. Um, there's also the continued use of specialty courts, uh, such as the behavioral health court, uh, where those cases take more time, and they, but on the other hand, they do provide for, you know, potentially more sustainable justice for those for those clients that enter them. Uh, so there, are, you know, there are factors on both sides that that drive uh, that drive caseload numbers uh, locally. Um, in terms of the budget, uh, you can see in the table here that the current contracts we have uh, provide about 13 million dollars of funding. Uh, it provides for about 35 attorneys who actually carry a caseload. Um, we don't know the exact number of support uh, support staff um, in those uh, in those current contracts. To fully fund the 6AC recommendation would be uh, about 16.6 million. Um, it would have 44 attorneys carrying a caseload and 54 uh, support staff, which would include, in this case, the you know the public defender, supervising attorneys, paralegals, investigators, uh, social workers, and other administrative staff. Um, in the CAO recommendation, uh, we said that we could fit a, a reasonable office within our current budget envelope of thirteen million dollars. Uh, provides for about thirty-eight attorneys to carry a caseload and about thirty-nine um, support staff. Um, it is, uh, we also want to note that um, in comparing uh, Santa Cruz County's funding of indigent defense to other counties, um, we compare uh, pretty favorably with the other 11 counties that we looked at, uh, both in terms of per capita, where the second highest funded um, indigent defense system among those 11 counties, and in terms of uh, looking at the public defender budget as a percentage of the district attorney budget, it's uh, actually the best funded of those 11 counties. So the ordinance that we're bringing before your board today is, uh, is the same ordinance that we brought on uh, October 6th. Um, it, uh, it's supported by all the partners, including the Superior Court uh, and, and the Bigham Law Firm. 
Um, it creates authority for the board to establish a public defender's office and establish the position of the public defender um, and is simply the first step towards that office. Uh, the ordinance, ordinance does it in, doesn't in and of itself implement a transition plan or begin a public defender recruitment or in any way um, you know, supersede the process that we're undertaking. With our, with our partners in the court and the, and the public defender law firms. Um, and with that, I'll give it back to Nicole to talk about the recommendations and next steps. So today um, we're asking the board to approve the recommended actions shown here. Um, one is to approve in concept the ordinance establishing a public defender's office in the position of public defender. Uh, the ordinance would be brought back for a second reading and final adoption on November 17th, if approved by the board today in concept. And then of course, our office um, will con would like to continue to collaborate with the justice partners and return with a detailed transition plan no later than next February. Um, we feel like we've had really productive conversations so far. We've been able to hear their concerns and I believe we have ways to address them and, and come back with consensus. Um, and so we appreciate all of the guidance of um, Larry Bingham, our public defender and the conflicts firms in the Superior Court. And we would ask that the board approve these actions today. And we're happy to answer any of your questions. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. We'll open it up to the board for questions. Uh, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, okay, yeah, thank you. And uh, I'm glad that uh, the parties were able to get together. And our goal here is really to serve the community the best of our ability. So uh, I think we're on the road to doing that. Um, I believe uh, creating this office as a successor agency um, uh, to the great work that's been done by our public defender, um, is uh, the right way to go. Um, I want to thank you again to our CAO and their leadership in bringing this item to the board um, and spending some additional time, as I mentioned. To, then I, to that end, I'd like to know um, what additional information has been gleaned. I think you, you probably mentioned some of this, but from those conversations since early October. And uh, you know, just the, the shape, you, you pretty much uh, explained that, but is there, uh, did they, um, are you pretty confident you can do this under the, the same um, spending envelope that uh, we have existing today? Supervisor McPherson, to answer your first question on the additional information we've gleaned, um, we've, um, we spent each meeting with the partners to um, hear all of their concerns. And I think we've learned about um, their concerns related to not wanting to disrupt operations and limit the impact um, on current operations. So we've heard that loud and clear and we're trying to figure out paths forward to, to try to, to limit those disruptions. Um, I, a lot of the concerns relate to how we're going to hire and retain the staff at the firms. And so we're trying to address those concerns. Um, and then the timing of the public defender recruitment, um, there's concern about you know, when that's gonna take place and whether it might impact whether attorneys stay or go. So we're trying to address that as well. Um, and so all in all, it, it really has to do with trying to keep things moving, um, you know, moving forward and limiting disruptions to the greatest extent possible. Um, and so hopefully that answers your question. And then in regards to the second question regarding the budget, we do believe we can establish a public office within our um, current budget envelope. And it will be something, you know, as we get a case management system and get a better handle on our local data and um, standards that we want to implement, we can build out the office from there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't have any questions. I appreciate the outreach that's been done uh, and the collaboration uh, to get us to a, to a good endpoint. So I want to appreciate, appreciate all the meetings that have happened since our last meeting and look forward to moving this forward. 
Supervisor Friend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you also for your continued collaboration with our justice partners. I think that, that we need to have as smooth of a transition as possible. I also appreciate the work you did reaching out to other counties and in a deeper dive into the Sixth Amendment Center's findings. I, I do think that uh, the report uh, probably had some findings that really weren't practical for our community to implement and, and aren't realistic. And so I think it's important that we do do a local review, as uh, Mr. Stafford had had mentioned, which is to, once we finish this transition, really do a case analysis uh, internally to determine a best practice model for us. Because I think some of these nationalized standards of which it, uh, I mean, I think one of the reasons that other communities weren't willing to communicate them was because it's because they're not meeting them. I mean, I think if they were if they were meeting some of these standards that the Sixth Amendment Center had outlined, I think people and I respect what they were trying to to do about uh, being concerned about releasing the information. But realistically, uh, I just don't think that many communities across the country are meeting these these expectations that were outlined in that report. And I, and I don't think that that uh, our community would be necessarily any different. So. I do think it's important for us to outline ways to improve uh, within our own metrics that that are actionable and and, and doable. And so I appreciate uh, that I actually look forward to hearing also from members of the community about this continued process and ways that we can ensure that this transition uh, be as seamless as possible. But thank you to Ms. Coburn and, and thank you, Sven, for your work on this. Okay. Thank you, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Thanks for this update. Um, uh, I take it as a good sign that the judiciary is not here uh, challenging us about uh, about what we're doing. That's probably we're probably moving in the right direction with that. Um, I uh, I do think it would be worthwhile to include some of this information about what other counties are doing as an addendum to the report. So when people that report is going to come back to haunt the county of Santa Cruz, that Sixth Amendment Center report, uh, because it it. It, it, it may have mischaracterized something in the judiciary. I don't, I'm not, a, I don't have the, um, uh, I don't have the information to know that, but we heard very clearly from the, the judges that that was, uh, that that was misrepresented and getting this comparison information from the other counties also was helpful to contextualize what that information is. Because I think that we're, the, the idea that we would be held to a standard that no one else is meeting um, it, it, it's, it's, it's just gonna, it's gonna be a problem down the line. And so I think it's important to have that as an addendum to, to make sure that any electronic uh, copies that go out, that it, that it has that information. Uh, so it better reflects what the actual situation is. You know, um, it's nice that uh, if we spend the money that we can actually have more attorneys and support staff or possibly more support staff, we don't know. Um, but we're actually putting less money in instead of more money in, even f with that. And my hope when we started this process that we were actually going to invest more money uh, in. Um, you know, as, as you pointed out in this, that that uh, that that we're spending comparatively to the DA's office uh, more than anybody else. But we got a a, 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 a two hundred page report that told us about all the failings of our system. So the fact that we're spending more uh, d doesn't give me any um, feelings of contentment that we're actually meeting the needs of the community and when it comes to their uh, public defense. And so, I, so th while we can feel good that we might be spending uh, more comparatively, uh, if we're trying to meet the needs of the report that we paid for, we should actually be investing more money into the system. And so, uh, you know, that'll be for our future board to make a decision about, but it's gonna, you know, it's, it, you can find these measures, right? You know, it's always, the, um, you can present something and without the context, it, it makes it seem like you're doing a lot. But if you look at the whole package, you would say, well, we're not. I mean, here's a report that told us all the problems we had and um, either we're, we're, we're doing better than most or we're, we're not using our money well. So uh, you, you can't have it all ways. So you have to uh, consider that. And that should have been thought about in the context of the report. I'm looking forward to hearing to comments in the public and I may have more questions after that. 
Yeah, I'll, uh, <coughs> thank you. Uh, I'll make a few comments and uh, uh, questions, but uh, we'll, we'll have the uh, public defenders and the, uh, you know, have their say also. But timing is a key thing with everything. We, uh, ever since I've been chairman of the board, uh, everything has fallen apart as far as the county government we know. <laughs> now that might be my fault, right? Yeah. I don't know, but That's the I'll way the rest you. of us are all considering it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But uh, I'd like to, you know, uh, cancel the year and start it over, but we can't do that. And I think we're doing the best we can. I, I don't like the timing of this, okay? we. Nicole, you've been doing a wonderful job uh, st uh, stepping in for uh, Carlos Palacios while uh, he's recovering from an operation. But uh, we not only don't have uh, a regular CAO, but we, ha we have an interim CAO, and that's putting a lot of responsibility on you and a lot of blame on you actually from people that disagree with the decision. Um, we had fires, COVID-19, everything breaking out. Uh, we, we have a full plate. We're dealing with all kinds of different things that are coming at us from different directions. And if it's, if it's working, everybody's saying it's working. Nobody wants to say a bad thing about the public defender's office. If it's working, what's the rush? Why are we rushing? Uh, we, we can take our time and uh, look at this one year from now, and then everything hopefully will be more calm. We're gonna make the same decision and time, uh, especially, I don't know, I don't know when, when you're raising kids, one, one day they're like five years old and a week later they're 10 years old. Time goes by quick. Uh, all of a sudden things you go, God, it couldn't have been just, uh, uh, it seems like it was a year ago and it was five years ago. So I'd, I'd like to put it off until, you know, like a year from now. And I might, I might agree then that it's time for a change or, and have everybody uh, agree. Uh, I like the, also the idea of public defenders being independent. I, uh, Somehow uh, the legality, I'm sure it's legal probably, but the legality of having your district attorney on county payroll, same entity as paying for them, and then also having the public defender's office under the same entity getting paid by the same payroll. Uh, you have both sides, uh, the prosecutor and the defendant. Uh, so there's a lack of independence that uh, seems to be glaring in my opinion. And um, uh, national standards, I saw that in there in the report. National standards, uh, the current public defenders are meeting national standards? Our current firms, based on the current staffing ratios and caseloads, they do not meet national standards. They are not? They do not, no. Based on the current caseloads and staffing levels, they do not. But staff was unable to find any county that is yeah. meeting those standards. Well, uh, they might disagree with that. Is that our determination? That they're not? That was meeting, a calculation that was standard. made. Well, we'll let them answer that. Uh, you know, I, I went along with the district attorney's neighborhood court uh, uh, that it will take some of the caseload off of smaller cases that might come before us. So that'll, uh, we'll be able to look at bigger cases a little bit closer. But anyway, um, I, I'm, I'm going to either, I, I don't, I don't agree with it. The timing is very bad. And, uh, if we waited a little longer, a year, that's, they're going to go by real quick. Uh, then I could, uh, we can all look at it and we can make a decision then. It would also allow uh, the current uh, public defenders, uh, they have families, they have uh, uh, problems, the same problems we do. And this is a big change. This is not like, uh, you know, some little uh, uh, nudge uh, changing a little bit here and there. This is a total transition, total change in everything. 
and uh, it would give them time and us time to look at it closer. So anyway, uh, I'll open it up to, I guess, what's the next step? We're gonna let the uh, public defender speak. Uh, public comment the public, would be next. Yeah, first them and then the, we'll open it up to the public. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I'm Larry Bigham, your contract public defender. And I wanna thank the CIO staff for reaching out and making this process more collaborative. The communication and the cooperation has clearly improved and I'm grateful. Um, I have no issue with today's ordinance giving the county the ability or the eventual option to create a public, public defender's office but do not change our de defense delivery system simply because you believe the current contractual model is somehow broken or defective or even unethical as that Boston report suggested or inferred. In fact, today's CAO's report on page two repeats a portion of that report when it says at least four states have also banned flat fee contracts for indigent defense, akin to those currently administered by the County of Santa Cruz. We have no kinship with those flat fee contracts. We are not a flat fee contract in Santa Cruz County. We are a flexible fee contract and we always have been. Let me explain. In a flat fee contract, all the costs come out of the contracted amount, including investigators and experts. So the firm's profit margin is reduced by the expenditures on experts and investigators. That would de-incentivize the hiring of experts and investigators. That would de-incentivize vigorous, <laughs> thorough and effective advocacy. The timer. Those flat fee contracts should be banned in all states. But that's not what we are in Santa Cruz. I am contractually obligated to provide seven full-time investigators. It's a fixed cost in my contract, whether I use them or not, and we use them. If I want an expert, I have to go to Tamara Rice and explain why it's relevant and required. And if she grants that request, or if a court grants that request, it comes out of a separate budget bucket, separate from my firm. Using investigators and experts in Santa Cruz County does not reduce our bottom line. We also have a clause, an escape clause for extraordinary fee cases, such as capital cases, that could really bankrupt a firm. On extraordinary fee cases, which are rare, but we have one now, they are billed outside of the contract. The fact that four states have banned flat fee contracts is frankly irrelevant to Santa Cruz County and misleading. We shouldn't conf confuse or conflate these two. And I just wanna make that very clear today. Our system of providing indigent defense is ethical, it's performance, effective and it's cost effective. On page four of the CIO's report today, it talks about spending for hundred thousands of residents. And we're toward the top with Napa and Marin. But there's a big asterisk, asterisk that should be behind that fact. Our crime rate is very high per capita. Our population can double on the weekends. Just ask the sheriff, they know far better than I. We are the playground for the Bay Area. 
And on Tuesday and Monday morning, we have a lot of orange jumpsuits in our criminal courts from people who may be partying too hard. We have more crime per capita than Napa and Marin. Our cost per case in defense spending is much less than the Bay Area Public Defender offices, including Napa and Marin. With respect to a percentage of the DA's budget, Santa Cruz is the highest in the state, I, I heard or I read. We need to be careful with this data. And yes, we could use more, but it's apples to oranges. We're a private firm. We have to, our, in our budget, that includes janitorial and lighting and equipment and parking and IT and personnel. A lot of those costs are not in the DA's budget. They're in the county budget. You gotta be careful here. But of the 13 million spent on indigent defense, our firm, which does 89% of the cases, costs 7.5 million, which is about 60% of the dollars, plus whatever it is for experts, and frankly, I don't have that. So you're getting a very good bang for the buck right now with the Bigham firm, which does the vast majority of this work. My concern, look, there are, there are good and bad aspects to any delivery system, the public model or the private model. And I've said this before, my concern is, is really not the delivery system. The quality of, of defense services depends less on the delivery system and more on the leadership and the staff and the resources and the political support. That Fresno office, which just got sued, were sued recently by the ACLU was a public model. I hire people out of that office. I still don't think they meet the national standards. Anecdotally, I'm informed they don't, but I don't have the data in front of me. My concern today is less about moving to a public model eventually. My, my concern is the timing of such a transition or a move, which can affect the ecosystem of the criminal justice system. I've been told there's never a good time to make a change like this. But there is a bad time, and that time is now. We're in a pandemic. The courts are dealing with an avalanche of unresolved cases that keeps building every day and we have no exit ramps or jury trials. We just started jury trials and we're gonna do one a week. That won't cut it. That won't cut it. So we've got this, we're running from this avalanche of unresolved cases that keeps building. And it's a pandemic which is triggered and keeps triggering changes and delays and stress in both the courthouse and in the jail. To the extent that we've survived as we have, it's due to the relationships and the trust and the stability in the system right now. I think changing your public defenders in the middle of this crisis is risky and unnecessary. I don't speak for the judges and the DAs, obviously, but I think they would agree with me. I believe it would be prudent to delay the transition for at least a year, perhaps two, so we can catch up and hopefully get back to some sense of normalcy. As you noted earlier, Chair Cabot, this is a big move which affects a lot of justice partners besides my office and my staff and my clients, including the jail and the DA's office and the judges and probation. But regardless of when this move is made, I intend to keep working with Fenn and Nicole and your board and the judges to make this transition 
as smooth and as successful as humanly possible under all these circumstances. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bingham, Mr. Bingham, could you just say a little bit more about why you think a year or two from now things will, will be different enough? I mean, it, one could argue that uh, right now when there's fewer trials going on that that might provide an opportunity to, to uh, work out some of these uh, details. So I'm just, I wonder if you could say more well, about that. I think there's a lot of chaos right now in the system and a lot of moving parts. And in the, I don't, I'm concerned that the clients are getting lost in the shuffle today, John. And if you start changing lawyers and w uh, in this context, I'm afraid that the clients are gonna be, um, be lost and lose that relationship with their, with their, with their lawyer. And, and obviously their lives and liberty, or mostly their liberty are at risk. That's, that's a concern. It's, it's hard to keep a track, keep a track on what's going on right now. And I just think, you know, if I lose lawyers in the transition, when I lose a lawyer, I don't lose just an employee. I lose, they lose their lawyer. I've got 100, 100 clients who lose their lawyer. So if I lose a lawyer, I've got 100 clients who've lost their lawyer. And now how do I backfill if I've got six months or eight months to go? It's hard to go hire a lawyer. No one's gonna move to Santa Cruz for that kind of job assurance. I just think we need to move slowly here. Well, uh, well, uh, I know uh, our direction at the last meeting was to come up with a maturity about the hiring of the existing public defenders into our new system. Uh, and I, and it's, it seemed at least from the report here was that there was positive movement on that, that we don't obviously have anything here in front of us, but the, the idea that, that we're gonna try to, to, to have as, as good of a, a transition with those folks, so it does not impact your firm. Um, in the meantime, was the goal, I think, of of, uh, of it. I'm not sure if anybody wants to weigh in I on that. I think you've stated it correctly, and we and we are working. Yeah, I we mean, are working. we I've we have, had we laid out a plan that would involve some orientation starting in the new year and ending in job offers by next summer. So. Okay. That's what we would like to work on. We're still, we're still talking about that. And I think Nicole and Sven understand the, the need to keep my lawyers down on the farm so they can do their job and the clients can have access to a lawyer during these tumultuous times. If I, if I lose staff, it's, very, it's gonna be traumatic, not only for the clients, but for the courts, because that triggers delays sure. further than what we already have. And we already have the shelf life for these cases now is double what it was two years ago. And, that's, we, they understand the issue. Uh, I just wanna make sure that I can keep the staff down. And I, I, I'm, I'm just saying every week we get new changes in the court, the court process. I mean, it's, we're all trying to you know, surf these, these tumultuous waves right now. Right. All right, thank you. I really appreciate it. You know, thank th you, thank you for all you've done for us. Uh, I, I have a question too, but... Uh, <clears throat> as far as independence uh, goes, either any, any of you could answer. Um, I, I, I don't have the uh, term in my mind, but uh, when, when somebody doesn't think they had good representation, uh, sometimes they go after their attorney. What's that called? Uh, it's called a Marsden hearing. If you feel you, you need, a, you know, you're not getting along with, the lawyer and the relationship is broken down, you can ask the court to appoint a new lawyer under a case called Marsden. Yeah, they, they blame like the result on the attorney. Uh, well, we get blamed a lot sometimes. Yeah, I know, <laughs> but with the, with the independence, uh, if that were to happen hypothetically, you would have to deal with it. If it was a county uh, employee, then uh, county council would be involved also, is that correct? Uh, I don't know. I think that would be taken up by the public defender's office We'd itself. We'd have to defend so, uh, somebody that's our employee. Right, and county council would probably have an attorney assigned to the and public the, and defender's office. a lot office. of times, uh, you know, in closed session or whatever, there, uh, there's a deal. And so the, what I'm getting at is the cost is more if we have to deal with it and we have the liability than if we uh, don't. 
It depends what the situation right. is. Okay. And yeah. yeah it's, it, it's solely hypothetical. The issue though is, is critical. Independence is critical and you did bring it up. And um, one part of the Sixth Amendment project that I actually agree with is when they said the public public defender needs to have a good cause uh, only for, for his ter him or her termination. And I really think independence is critical because we speak truth to power. We try to keep the cops, the judges, and the DAs on the rails so they don't take constitutional shortcuts. So sometimes we're not very popular. And if, we're a, if I'm the public defender with an at will to you guys or to the CIO, it could neuter my advocacy. That's my concern. Independence is critical to a good public defender office. That's one thing that we have. And, and if we're gonna change it, I would hope you give your public public defender a contract with a good cause only termination so that you know, the sheriff or the judges can't call you uh, some night and say, get rid of these guys, they're a pain in the back. So I'm, I'm just saying we need to work carefully and, and we are, I'm working now and talking with Nicole and Sven and we're trying to work out some of these issues. Yeah. Uh... The, I guess the last thing too is, uh, I remember I got called for jury duty about two years ago. And uh, I, I, I showed up, I knew I would probably end up being, I, I could have got out of it. I could have said I'm a supervisor and whatever. But uh, anyway, I went through the process and I, I almost expected that they go, well, uh, you know, what's your relationship with the sheriff's department? What's your relationship with the uh, district attorney's office? And I told them uh, we're familiar. I mean, I say hi, I, I consider them all good, you know, guys and whatever. And anyway, they excused me. They said, thank you. Uh, that was the right thing to do because of the familiarity of myself and uh, the DA's office just saying hello. It's not like we're uh, going out for dinner or going to a movie together or something, and also with the sheriff's department. So what I'm getting at is the independence is hard to uh, break when you're working next door to uh, fellow employees of the county of Santa Cruz. So anyway, that's just a little insight of my own. Yeah, I, I, w I wouldn't qualify to be on that jury because of uh, my familiarity of, of, and so if I was able, if I was independent of, of the county, I was a supervisor or somewhere else, uh, then, uh, then it would be okay. I wouldn't be familiar with anybody. So anyway, that, that's the important thing to me about independence. Thank you. Uh, if I wouldn't qualify to be on a jury, I wouldn't qualify to, you know, uh, have to deal with the district attorney's office and the uh, public defender's office all under the same umbrella, the county of Santa Cruz. Anyway, uh, uh, we'll open it up to the public for public questions or comments. Do we have any? We have no public comment. And uh, anyway, I, I'd, I'd like to just put this off. Uh, there's really no reason to rush and no reason to have hard feelings on anybody's part. Uh, if I'm, I'm gonna, I'll make an amendment or a motion that sure. we sure, uh, look at this one year from now after the COVID-19 is over uh, and also after people have somewhat recovered from uh, having the huge fires that we've had in the county of Santa Cruz, everything is uh, finally somewhat getting back to normal. This is not a little change, this is a big change. And it's some, something that needs to be looked at under a uh, calm atmosphere without all kinds of pressure coming from all sides. And a year will go by like, and we'll be looking at it. So I don't know. Uh, Chair Kappa, I'll just the motions need to come from one of the other members, but I did want to reiterate that, you know, we've been looking at this and thinking about this for quite some time now. 
And um, this, this ordinance would allow us to, you know, think about how we're gonna make this transition. So this is not something, um, you know, that we've taken lightly. This is something we've been seriously considering for quite some time. Um, and, you know, I would, I would urge the board to push forward with this ordinance so that we can um, move forward and make this the first step toward implementing the transition. Now, how that transition looks and the exact timing of it, we're gonna come back to the board in February with that plan. Back in when? February. No, I, I saw that, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm saying that we actually look at it, put it off for a year and then uh, come back and look at the whole thing. And hopefully everybody be totally at ease with the whole thing, the CAO's office and the public defenders and the judges for that matter. Um, I don't know. So, but I, I can't make a motion, right? No, but if somebody makes it, I can second it. So I, I could ask uh, if any board member would consider uh, putting the uh, transition from going from uh, private to public uh, employees on this uh, for one year. You, you don't all have to rush at the same time. <laughs> okay. Mr. Chair. Yes, Supervisor. I, I do. I hear what you're saying, and and I um, and I do understand it. Um, although I still think that what's before us today is the creation of a process. Um, something that I that I heard Mr. Bigham say that he supports in concept the creation of the process. The concern is with the details over the transition and the timeline of the transition and how the transition will look, uh, which are concerns that I share. Uh, so, but what's before us today is, is the initiation of a process that allows the work behind the scenes to ensure that um, this can actually happen at all. So I'm, I'm gonna move the recommended actions and this isn't additional direction, this is just additional commentary and just say that, you know, the board still wants to ensure that these voices are at the table and that they're taken seriously as, as it sounds like um, those discussions have been occurring for the last four weeks because the issues around the staffing and the issues around the timing are uh, very important issues, I know, to the entire judiciary, not just the public defender directly. So uh, anyway, I'll move the recommended actions. Uh, the recommended action with with your comments also? The comments are not additional direction. They're just, I, I think that, that uh, Ms. Coburn, I, I think that Nicole and Sven are, are understanding that the board, that what the board asked for a few weeks ago has not changed in our concerns regarding uh, how this transition will take place. This is just a support in the initiation of the creation of a public defender's office. Uh, but it's the very initial stages in the February. Uh, what what really will be of interest again is what comes back in February with the outlines of the transition. So I'm supportive of the initiation today, which is what's before us, which is why I'm moving the recommended actions. And I'll second that. Okay. Uh, I guess that concludes public comment, and uh, uh, we're ready for a vote. Call for a vote, Leopold. Aye. Uh, friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Chair Caput? No. Yeah. So here we go to item number eight. Is it eight? Yes. Item number eight. Ooh. Consider the report on the establishment of the Office of Response, Recovery, and Resiliency of approved transfer of funds from contingencies in the amount of $600,000 for the OR3 in fiscal year 2020 and 2021, approve addition of two full-time equivalent positions to staff OR3 programs and operations 
and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the county administrative officer, uh, CSU fire recovery framework and AUD 74 transfer of funds for OR3. <coughs> uh, we have a report and then we'll have questions from the board. Okay. Good afternoon, board members. I'm Melody Serino. This is Matt Machado, and we're both deputy CAOs. We're here to follow up on the intrusion that the board uh, chambers are muted. All set? Yes. Okay, <laughs> we'll start over again. Good afternoon. <laughs> I'm uh, Melody Serino. This is Matt Machado. We're both deputy CAOs, and we're here to follow up on your direction from October 6th to establish an Office of Recovery and Resilience in order to chart our road to recovery following the CZU Lightning Complex fire. Uh, this is um, our agenda. Uh, recovery encompasses many complex and interdependent activities, some of which are technical in nature and some of which are known as adaptive challenges. We're going to go through our recommendations regarding the proposed new division of the County Administrative Office uh, based on the agenda right here. Thank you, Melody. So a framework was established in the fire aftermath to address the immediate needs of human care, such as connecting fire victims to services and financial support and working with our state and federal partners to begin the cleanup process. The framework also incorporated the critical community needs of emergency preparedness and community resilience as a means to assist in stabilizing our community now and in the future. The framework was designed to utilize current staff with these assignments added to their current duties. The framework was created based upon FEMA guiding principles of disaster recovery. I'll direct your attention to the segment of human care, which is very critical to human life. Also to the segment of rebuild and recovery, which is very visible, which includes the physical elements of public and private infrastructure. And the segment of emergency preparedness and community resilience, which is very essential to our future. This effort will be important for years to come. We must be able to sustain this level of effort leading to an adjusted framework. You're the runner of the machine. <laughs> Thank you. Given the board's direction on October 6 to establish the new division with dedicated full-time staff, as well as the addition of the ad hoc committee, staff recommends keeping the current framework as a way, as a way, if you want. Thank you. as a way to operationalize the work at the department level and overlaying the new division on top of this framework for maximum effectiveness. All work will flow through the assistant CAO to ensure appropriate coordination of efforts. This effort includes core capabilities of recovery and preparedness. This adjusted and recommended framework addresses the county needs of emergency response, rebuild and resiliency. The budget hearings in August placed the Office of Emergency Services under the CAO and restructured this division. While the board's direction on October 6th identified a number of duties for the Office of Resilience and Recovery, staff believes there is critical interdependencies between the work of emergency services and this new office. For example, the coordination of information during an emergency across federal, state, and local agencies is also critical during the post-emergency recovery stage and pre-planning for disasters as well. OR3, as we're calling it, um, also incorporates aspects of the climate change responsibilities, particularly as they relate to the development of community resilience activities. Recognizing these interdependencies and in order to ensure successful coordinated efforts, staff recommends combining the duties of the emergency services and the Office of Resiliency and Recovery into one division in the CAO office. Pre and post-disaster operational coordination crosses all mission areas, 
and is critical to the efficient and effective recovery activities. As noted by the board, the work ahead cannot be done by adding part-time duties to current staff. While the board requested that staff seek to staff the ORR with current employees, further analysis of the work to be done indicates that removing staff from departments already reduced through retirements, furloughs, and layoffs is not advisable. Instead, staff recommends the addition of two additional staff, a director and an additional analyst. With the restructuring of the Office of Emergency Services at budget hearings, an analyst position and the current administrative aid were already budgeted into the CAO um, budget for OES work. The additional staff will take on the work of recovery and resilience, including some aspects identified previously for the climate action manager, such as seeking out grant opportunities to fund resilience projects in relation to climate change activities. All of the duties outlined by the board in October 6 direction are included as duties in the proposed new structure. Under this structure, duties previously the responsibility of the Director of Emergency Services, such as grants, grants writing and management, FEMA and Cal OES coordination and disaster preparedness training and staffing will be transferred to an analyst position, leaving the Director time to concentrate on managing efforts to prepare for and respond during and post emergency to community needs. While specific job classifications and descriptions need to be created, it is anticipated that each position will also be assigned a specific role in the emergency operations center in operations center incident command structure to ensure continuity of operations pre, during, and post disaster. As we recruit a new director and incident commander, Lisa Benson will be our recovery coordinator, working closely with our framework managers so we can speak as a single coordinated voice. The budget information here reflects anticipated costs from December 1st through the end of the current fiscal year. Funding of $600,959 would be allocated from contingencies for the purposes of establishing this division. Of course, this budget does not reflect the entirety of costs that will be devoted to the recovery efforts. Additional costs such as our local match for response, repairs to infrastructure and debris removal, as well as costs for consultants to assist with permitting, and you'll be hearing about that next week, and FEMA reimbursements must also be covered through contingencies. We will be actively and continually pursuing grants to support the functions of this office and their projects. This will help with the long-term sustainability of the office. Studies have indicated that the single biggest failure of leadership is to treat adaptive challenges as technical problems. Preparing for, responding to, and recovering from a disaster involves both technical and adaptive challenges. However, vastly different skills, timelines, and actions are necessary for technical versus adaptive challenges. A simple example is responding to high blood pressure. A technical solution would be to take medication to lower your blood pressure, while an adaptive solution would be to change your lifestyle, to incorporate more exercise, different eating habits, or reducing your level of stress. These are some examples of a, the differences between technical and adaptive work. In charting our efforts over the course of recovery, and particularly for resiliency, both technical and adaptive work will be required. Much of the adaptive work will be difficult, involving numerous conversations with lots of stakeholders, require the weighing of competing values, and sometimes may take longer than we like. Yet it is the adaptive work that will define our future resiliency and influence the work of those who come after us. It will take courageous conversations, listening with the open minds, and the practice of adaptive leadership not just from you, our elected officials, but from our community members as well. We believe Santa Cruz County is up to the challenge and the Office of Response, Recovery and Resiliency is the first step in building that foundation of work. 
OR3 will lead, coordinate, and drive the recovery process. It will coordinate and leverage recovery core capability resources. It will integrate the interest of the whole community into ongoing recovery efforts and future initiatives. It will ensure cross mission and cross capability integration through information sharing and coordination. It will establish mechanisms to more effectively engage whole community partners. It will improve future operational coordination through continual process improvement. This is not status quo. This is a new direction with lasting positive impacts to our community. The item before you includes three recommendations. I'll read those and then we can conclude and open questions. First, accept and file a report on the establishment of the Office of Response Recovery and Resiliency. Second, approve transfer of funds from contingencies in the amount of $600,959 for establishment of the OR3 in fiscal year 2021 and approve addition of two full-time equivalent positions to the County Administrative Office budget to staff OR3 programs and operations, one director and one analyst, and direct the CAO to refer the positions to the personnel department for classification, recruitment, and hiring. This concludes our presentation, and we look forward to your comments on this proposal. Additional colleagues are available to help answer your questions. Well, maybe I'll start off with some questions, if that's okay, Chair. Okay. Um, uh, just a couple different things. One is, I think this is a really good um, <clears throat> move that we're making. I think it will help us in the short term uh, with those folks who are trying to move back into their homes that were destroyed. And I think it helped us in the long term when we look at the issues of emergency preparedness and resiliency. Um, one of the things I didn't see in, in that long term plan was looking at our climate action strategy and adaptation plan, which I think is going to be critical uh, to uh, the, that long term planning. It will not only be critical for us to start thinking about how extreme weather events like the lightning storms that we saw this year or sea level rise will affect us, but having a document prepared with those adaptation strategies will make it more attractive to uh, acquire that grant money that will hopefully be coming from the state and federal government. So I just, I just think it needs to be included as part of uh, the work here. Um, <clears throat> I also think that it's, it's going to be really important um, to do everything we can. And I know we're going to hear an item next week at our board meeting about what we're doing about the permitting process, staffing, um, and in order to expedite that process. And I think that this office is going to have to work uh, hand in glove uh, with uh, the contractors that we're bringing in with our planning department staff uh, to make sure that we meet the needs of the community as quickly as possible. I, there, are, there are people who are ready to move in yesterday and there's obviously a process that has to be followed. Some of it is not determined by us, but by state and federal authorities. Um, but, I, but I'm looking forward to seeing this uh, office be staffed and meet the needs of the community. I appreciate the work you put into thinking about it. And I like the, the three elements of this um, uh, plan and the way in which you've conceived it. So thank you. Good, thank you. Mr. Chair, this is Supervisor McPherson. I want to, you can hear me all right? Okay. We can hear you. Uh, okay. I want to thank the CAO and the departments of uh, planning, Tools, and environmental health on building uh, out the structure for this new office. Uh, it's critical it to be established in a way that meets um, the urgent needs that we have uh, for our fire survivors right now will also mean the challenges of the future, uh, emergency management and climate preparedness. And I, I really take to heart uh, the comments made by um, uh, Supervisor Leopold, I think it's um, very important that we we be very inclusive and uh, be forward looking in what we might be experiencing in the future. Uh, when Supervisor Coonerty and I brought this uh, the creation of this office to the board, we did so with the intent of ensuring that our residents experienced an, an efficient and predictable, affordable 
rebuilding process, in addition to the other goals that we had set out to achieve uh, for stre strengthening resilience. And to that end, I think it is important to point out that the sizable investment we will be making in hiring an outside firm to management, manage the uh, permitting process is very, very important. And I'd like to uh, reiterate how important it, it will be for the public to have a single point of contact to ask questions and resolve conflicts as they move through this process. As we know, we've had 940 plus people lose their homes, families, and uh, uh, so forth. Uh, so it's uh, really important that we get them the answer as straightforward and as efficiently and, and politely as we can. With that said, I, I'd like to be to under, better understand how rebuilding will be prioritized within this structure in the near term, considering that phase two starts in a matter of weeks now, and we're not likely to have this office staffed right away. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. This is Matt Machado. Uh, to answer your question, uh, we've structured this such that there is a standalone segment for the rebuild effort, the physical environment, the public and private infrastructure rebuild. And that single segment will have a single voice. And that's how we've structured it with a single management style. And I think that will respond to not only your uh, question and concerns, but the public's questions and concerns. And so we structured it to have that, that point of contact. Uh, there is uh, other coordination, but when you're speaking to just that one segment, that one segment is quite clear. Okay, very well. That, that gives me a little more comfort. Uh, I felt comfortable anyway, but that's, that's great to hear. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, this is Ryan Coonerty. Um, I guess uh, I don't have any questions. I want to thank the uh, staff for their uh, responsive effort to build this office. Um, I appreciate what Ms. Serena is talking about in terms of adaptive versus technical ch uh, challenges or meeting those challenges. Um, I guess my, my only comment, uh, because I think as Supervisor Leopold mentioned, this is going to be an excellent resource in both the short term, but also in the long term, as we move into a new reality of uh, stronger storms, uh, more disaster events, more need for recovery, um, and partnering with our federal and state uh, partners um, is to really emphasize that while our current staff has done an absolutely amazing job and been very responsive, I am worried um, if this takes too long to staff up as we go into winter and we have debris flows, an increase in COVID, uh, more and more complex property issues, the rebuilding process, um, and God forbid any other uh, natural disasters occurring in our region, um, that uh, the current uh, point people uh, will be uh, already are working with full plates and we're adding this and a growing list uh, to those concerns. And so the sooner we can get somebody in there to build those relationships, um, because one of the best ways to address both technical and uh, adaptive challenges is to have relationships, to be able to quickly solve problems. Um, we need to get um, staff in there who can focus and build the relationships so that um, we aren't uh, bouncing uh, around with a lot of different calls in already challenging times. So anything we can do to expedite the hiring and staffing up. Um, again, I appreciate the current staff. I just know that they have a lot on their plates and, and more to come. Supervisor Coonerty, this is Melody Serena. We appreciate the urgency of this. We already have meetings scheduled with personnel for this week. Um, if you approve this going forward to go over job descriptions um, and prepare for the recruitments, um, and of course, all staff that have been working this continue to remain committed uh, to working through these issues and continuing to serve the needs of the community until appropriate staff is hired. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the only th uh, we're adding two full-time positions. Is that correct? Yes, that is okay. correct. Let's say uh, everything 
it's going well. There, there'd be uh, under the uh, county administrative officer's uh, office, right? That's correct. Okay, so let's say we don't have any disasters. We have, there's good years and bad years. And let's say we have like three or four years where nothing much is going on. Once they've established their uh, responses and things where they have everything organized, what do they do? So I'll, I'll chime in on that. And so there's always a need to be constantly prepared and trained. And then with this climate change and the need for resiliency, that will be a continual effort that'll be needed forever. And so that will fall upon uh, the shoulders of this new group these two new employees. And so they'll be doing emergency preparedness and they'll be doing a pursuit of grants, which, which will be for climate action and resiliency together. And so there's a lot to do in that area. That, those are full-time jobs by themselves. And then of course, we all know, uh, you're probably right, every three years or so, we seem to have an emergency. And so that's nearly a full-time job because just as in the situation of the fires, we're, going to be three to five years for a full rebuild. That's a full-time job for quite quite a few years to come. Right. No, I'm, I'm all for being prepared. I'm all for everything, but I just uh, I can't see them spending a lot of time working when uh, maybe a, f a few years go by and everything's going well. It's kind of like the uh, uh, National Guard. I was in that and uh, we didn't. Uh, we we only really got together after training and stuff, uh, one weekend a month, uh, right, and but we were supposedly you know ready for uh, a, a disaster. But so I I'm, uh, I'm I'm wondering about the downtime of the job. We're so, still rebuilding from 2017, and yeah, it's going to take not, us. You can tell so, you don't have roads affected by the 2017 <laughs> storms because yeah. we're still trying to get them fixed. I mean, we just put a bridge okay. on Redwood Lodge. Yeah. from the 2017 storms because of the amount of paperwork it takes to get that done. And then the pursuit of and reimbursement and the continual paperwork that follows yes. the, the chains of disaster. So it's ongoing. Yeah. Sure. I would okay. also... I'm only asking this because uh, we're, we've just got through uh, laying off or t uh, terminating 39 positions uh, out of our <laughs> county staff. And then here we're adding two full time. It's kind of like saying, well, uh, this full time, these two full time positions are much more important than the other 39 that we eliminated. But anyway, I'm okay. I'm okay with it. Go ahead. I, I just had one more quick question that just came up as part of this is if, if we have another uh, incident like the 2017 storm incident, which primarily affected public infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Is that going to be a DPW only, or is this Office of Resource Recovery and Resilience going to be involved with that? I mean, how, how, what do you envision? I, I think that's one, of, that's one of the advantages of the OR3. We're creating coordination, and we're creating cross-training and, and a team. Yep. And so future disasters, there may be a primary lead, like you say. If it's a road-centric, it would be led by DPW. but. But this team that we're creating is going to have the reinforcements and the knowledge and, and kind of the reinforcements to be more successful in the future. And even in those situations, the most, you know, uh, in the moment of the disaster, this team is going to be absolutely critical to address those needs and be more prepared for the response that follows after the disaster is mm -hmm. over. So that's where the value of this team comes in. Right. Great. Great. Yeah, and I would just point out to my colleague that uh, we're, uh, we're a county that sees fires, floods, um, earthquakes, sea level rise, and tsunamis. That's the, I mean, all of that is, it's not just history, it's like recent history. It's, it's in the last 10, 12 years. Almost I, all those I things. would only add in response to Supervisor Caput's question, earlier question. The work to do within the community is a lot of work. Um, as you know, dealing with constituents, right? As part of your, the main part of your job. Um, and so downtime, um, it, it really is about making sure we're connecting with the community, making sure that they, we understand their needs, um, whether we're in a disaster or not. 
um, or recovering from a death, disaster or preparing for a disaster, making sure we can maintain those connections and that we have that infrastructure in place so that when a disaster occurs, it isn't just the county government that's responding. It's this network that we've created that enables the response to be successful. I'm not sure whether uh, Supervisor McPherson had something, his hands up. I'm not sure if he's- Yeah, thank you <laughs> for seeing that from afar. I, and I, I appreciate uh, Mr. Caput. It was a it was a nightmare going through this uh, budget this year and I understand, but uh, the uh, we I was gonna mention the 2017 storms in Sonoma, which had gone through a disaster six years ago and they're still on the road to recovery. And so th this takes a long time. If this could get done in a year or two, boy, I'd be, I'd love it, but it's gonna be a long haul. And I think another important part of that is the resiliency factor. I mean, just everything from informing pe uh, people about vegetation management and the, ma uh, the importance of that around their homes and so forth. I mean, that could all be part of this message that we're, we're doing while we're rebuilding. We can let people know what they can do to avoid uh, dis uh, you know, uh, you know, a disaster that might take their house down. Maybe they could take some action. So there's a lot of parts to this and it's absolutely necessary. I'm a, as beautiful as Santa Cruz County is to live in and I've been here all my life. Uh, somehow we're the, at the eye of the, the tiger sometimes if they want to come by with a storm or a flood or a fire or whatever. So um, I am really, uh, I know we're all set that we need this to happen and I wish it could be done and said and done and we could be feel comfortable in a year or two, but that's just not reality. It's going to take a long time and uh, God knows what's ahead. So uh, I do appreciate um, the work that's been done and uh, to bring this forward. Uh, it's absolutely necessary. And I don't know if we've gone through the public comment yet, but I would be ready to move the recommended actions public comment uh, yeah uh, okay well, uh, if there's no other comments i'll open it up to the public for public comment and now's your opportunity and we have no web comments okay so let's see the bring it back to the board uh, we do have a motion i'll second it and we have a second and if we could have a vote Supervisor Leopold? Aye. Friend? Supervisor Friend? Supervisor Coonerty? Aye. Supervisor McPherson? Aye. Supervisor Friend? I think he accidentally, he dropped off. His connection wasn't so great. Okay. Yeah. And Chair Caput? Aye. Uh, Thank you. Motion passes. Yeah. Okay, that'll take us to item number nine. Consider final appointment of Stephen Allen to the Assessment Appeals Board as an at-large representative for a term to expire September 6, 2021. I move approval. Okay, we have a motion. Uh, let's see, a any public comment? None. Okay, we have a motion and a second. I'll call for the vote. Supervisor Leopold? Aye. Friend? Coonerty? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Chair Caput? Aye. Okay, uh, we've done a uh, closed session and we also, uh, now, the next regular meeting uh, will be 9 a.m. Tuesday, one week from today, November 17th, 2020. Want to wish everybody a uh, happy and proud uh, Veterans Day tomorrow, um, November 11th. Okay, thank you. <laughs>